Excuse us. Pardon me, ma'am. Sorry, sorry. Move it, asshole. Oh, thank God. We got good seats. Damn right we did. What's up? We got the drink. We got the popcorn. And the candy. I think we're ready, man. Hey, guys. Sorry I'm late. The bathroom here is nuts. Oh, my God. You made it. Yeah. It's about time, Nathan. Damn. Shh. The movie's starting. I am Nathan Simmons, and it's been a long, long time, broheem. And I said coffee! <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this is... <laughs> The Silver Linings Playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's bleakest endings, a history of bleak endings, I should say. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, unfortunately, we are not joined this week, as res- regular listeners will know. There's usually a third voice here, but yes. uh, Mally, uh, you know, he's up in Philadelphia. He's talking to his, <laughs> his brother. I, yeah. I don't know. He just kind of went off in the middle of the night, so who knows? Yeah, he just left us a note that said, a history of absence, and I don't know what that means. <laughs> And I will say, like, last week, Mally was here, you were not. Yeah. And then the week before that, you were here and Mally was not. So it's it's kind of- You're holding down the fort. Yeah. 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 I'm, I got, I'm keeping things running, so- You're the Maria Bello of this podcast. Oh, my God. And I, I think it's about time we all said it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. I never got to be a teenager either, unfortunately. No, no. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll fix that tonight. Uh- <laughs> but you do have a ton of pubes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure do but that's okay because since Mally's not here we went and found someone to fill his shoes that's right hopefully that's not too much pressure for you but returning to talk we're continuing the Cronenberg tradition here in this yeah. in this house but we're being joined by none other than Josh Browning coming back welcome back What's going on, fellas? I'm the resident uh, Cronenberg fan, I guess. Oh, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. You've got your, you got your friend who comes on for the uh, the Halloween episodes. I mm-hmm. guess every time there's a Cronenberg movie, I'm invited back. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I mean, I, as soon as I put this on the schedule, I was like, look, I'm going to reach out. Like, I think I might not have even done this movie if you weren't available. <laughs> <laughs> it just felt right. Yeah. No, this does feel right. And before we get started, I guess we should, let's do, let's do some plugs, because I feel like we don't ever do plugs for our guests. Sure. But Josh, you've got a couple of different things happening on your end right you got vhs files and then you've got for new eyes only i got the title right on that one right? yeah yeah man me and nathan got together and nathan's a big bond fan mm-hmm. and i had never seen any of the legacy bond pictures mm-hmm. so we decided hey i'll watch them for the first time me and nathan can jump on and talk about it and uh it's been fun so far we just finished up all the connery movies Ooh, yeah. and okay. uh so so what's the fa- what's the favorite connery or if there are are there any uh if i had to go my favorite connery at this point Mm -hmm. you may have to tune into our next episode oh (laughs) what a perfect plug yeah what a perfect plug that is a great plug you you unknowingly set us up nicely (laughs) although i I will say of the ones we've covered so far my favorite uh doesn't star sean connery sure so. well, i'll agree with that i will sure. say my favorite so far is the one without connery yeah <laughs> I, I think i can make a pretty good guess on that one yeah um but people can find those podcasts uh, on their typical podcasting platforms i'm assuming yeah, yeah. yeah. um for new eyes only is actually part of the vhs files feed mm. so it's all in one spot yeah it's just kind of a little sub show that we included instead of making a whole new channel all that stuff sure, we just put sure. it in lumped it in with ours and mm-hmm. um we've been having a good time on the the vhs files lately just talking about um well we just talked about all of our halloween movies now we're getting into christmas and mm-hmm. we're doing a slew of like christmas horror pictures so it's been really fun uh just recorded our black christmas episode Ooh. and that'll be coming out in december love that movie yeah oh, dude i had not seen it very much and like this rewatch it hit me on how good and influential that fucking movie is Absolutely. totally really well acted too yes and then you've got like the polar opposite no pun intended but you're doing <laughs> silent night deadly night Mm. which is a significantly <laughs> less good picture. <laughs> the one I've seen the most out of the two is that one. Uh-huh. <laughs> and yeah, um, I, I had a love for that one as a kid. Sure. And as I've gotten older, it's just continued to like decrease in value for me. <laughs> but I, I still go back and watch it almost every Christmas. Yeah. Like I just can't get away from it. Wow. Gotcha. You know? That's so funny. It's just, a, but still it's, it's not, it's not the greatest movie. No, <laughs> absolutely. Well, this episode, uh, I'm just looking real quick. This episode is coming out. This is the, first episode of december so that's kind of like perfect timing with the black christmas and all that so yeah yeah, everyone go check out uh, the vhs files uh, wherever you get your podcasts absolutely get us uh, wherever you get your podcast and we're on youtube uh, youtube at the uh, vhs files podcast perfect perfect 
Well, now that we got that out of the way, let's let's talk about the reason we're here, which is the, the real reason for this season. <laughs> a history of violence. So, Nathan, this is your pick. Yeah. Josh, I'm assuming you've seen this one at least a couple times before. Uh, yes, I've seen this one. This is probably this is actually probably only my like my third or fourth watch of this movie. I haven't mm, seen this one okay. a ton, mm. but yeah, um, I I kind of had some mixed feelings about it this time, but we'll talk about that when we get into it. Same. Yeah, I was I was saying that uh, off mic a little bit too. Yeah. So so Nathan, why this one in particular? Why now? Uh-huh. What about the first time you saw it? Did it hold up on this time? So yeah. So this was one of if not my first David Cronenberg film. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit of a landmark in, in that regard. Wow. Like even, even before the fly, I think so. Wow. I think I saw this first. Okay. Uh, it's, it's kind of hard to, to, to remember. I saw the fly, the dead zone previous uh, <laughs> silver linings movie. And, and this one like roughly around the same time. But um, this one was a, a, this one has a special place in my heart because my mom used to have this job where she would prep the videos that were going to like a local rental place. So like we would get new releases like a week, a week and a half before they hit store shelves. Mm -hmm. And she would like, box them and put get them ready to like put them out on the shelves mm-hmm. and so we were watching new releases like a, a week early and that was always really exciting but it also meant that i was watching uh, a lot of r-rated movies that <laughs> uh my parents would not have allowed me to rent sure <laughs> and so i was this was like a sneaky late night watch for me and at the time it really blew me away I, I was like i don't know that i had really seen anything sort of the trailers kind of build this as an action movie and yeah. this is much more of a contemplative drama in a lot of ways i would even say it might even be like noir like, mm-hmm. like oh, yeah, a noir absolutely. movie almost like. and, and also i knew that it was based on a comic book by the guy who created judge dread so wow. i was like <laughs> which like this is as far away as you can get from judge dread but sure, sure. at the time i was just like wow that was a lot smarter and a lot more uh thoughtful than i expected it to be and it it kind of stuck with me for years, and I would you know every once in a while I'd say you know hey you know that what, what a good a good movie is the history of violence like that would just come up in conversation, and I don't know why it was like a touchstone for movies that are violent but aren't action flicks yeah. you know what I mean like yeah, yeah. they're like kind of punctuated by these action set pieces, but that's not like the driving force. And I've I think I've watched it one time between then and now, and on this watch I found myself having this feeling that and, and Josh can maybe correct me because he's he's a lot more of a a, a Cronenberg fan than I am or he's seen c- certainly seen more of his work than I have but my typical feeling about David Cronenberg is I find that he uh goes with scripts that he can where he 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 goes with scripts that have decent bones for whatever he wants to hang on to them you know what mm-hmm. I mean like this is a story that like the the dialogue is a little perfunctory in places. There's there's almost times where this feels a little bit like a lifetime movie. Yeah. yeah. And then and then he's he's it's elevated by the performances and the direction. Mm-hmm. And I, you don't know, we can go get into it as we go along, but there are moments here where I was either thinking you're laying it on a little thick or we need 10 more minutes of this. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's also just astonishing cuz in my head it was more of this like slow burn but this is 90 minutes with credits yeah mm-hmm. i mean this is yeah he he gets to richie's house at 78 minutes and he's sitting down for dinner at 90 minutes <laughs> yeah it, that ending gets gets resolved real quickly it yeah. sure does well i'll say that this is this podcast is actually filling uh, a big void in my film watching <laughs> history because sure cronenberg is an area i had not previously ventured into uh, until we did the dead zone, um, which, you know, I did not care for that much. Sure. <laughs> However, uh, since then, I have seen, I mean, well, I guess you don't count Possessor because that's his son, but mm-hmm. I have since seen, on my own choosing, I've seen Videodrome. Hell yeah. Which was pretty good. Yeah. Videodrome is a fantastic movie. <laughs> I, I, I found it a very interesting. I'll say that. I, and I don't say I love it, but it was, it was good. It was very good. Yeah. And just recently, I tried to watch 31 horror movies for October, 31 new horror movies. Uh-huh. And one of the ones I watched was The Brood, nice. which also equally as interesting, but I didn't love. That tends to be my response to Cronenberg, mm-hmm. it, it, with very few exceptions. I'm just like, man, I, I love that you made this, but I don't know that I'll revisit it. Yes. Right. I 
could not stomach Crimes of the Future. I was just about to say, and the other one I had seen is the new Crimes of the Future, which was, again, equally, I feel kind of the same about all of them. Uh I would say of those, Videodrome was probably the one I enjoyed the most, but Crimes of the Future was fine. Coming from a Cronenberg fan, Uh (laughs) uh, Crimes of the Future is like a return to form for for Cronenberg for me. That's my understanding as well, yeah. But it it just felt so low-key. Like, Uh the whole movie is very quiet that's how this one is right yeah like it's very much like we're just kind of hanging out with this guy for a few days <laughs> that's sort of cronenberg in a nutshell like mm-hmm. cronenberg has never been a a big time filmmaker i mean right. he's big in the horror community and, and whatnot but sure cronenberg's not you know the biggest filmmaker yeah it's not like george a romero like in your face kind of stuff it's right. very low-key right right he's yeah. just made movies that will stand out in your mind uh-huh. uh, for certain scenes and imagery and and social comments Terry that he does in his movies that's usually what makes a Cronenberg movie stick with you but I guarantee you if you ask somebody hey have you seen that Cronenberg movie A History of Violence a yeah. lot of people probably don't even realize David Cronenberg wrote, uh, directed that movie yeah. right you know so this is now my fifth I suppose. Okay. So I had to watch this movie twice because the first time I watched it, I took notes and stupidly I did it on my phone. I took notes on my phone and then I somehow, my, phone, my iPhone just deleted my notes. So I lost all my notes for the movie and I was like, fuck, okay. I hate when that happens. Yeah. And I didn't realize this until just a few days ago mm. uh, when I was in LA. And so on, when I was at the airport, I got there a little early because I, antici- <laughs> oh, I anticipated no. there being a lot of foot traffic with the holidays and everything so i got there early Mm -hmm. and i'm sitting there and i'm like two hours before my plane takes off and i'm like well shit i got nothing to do i guess i'll just rewatch history of violence and i can take proper notes and so i'm just posted up in the at the gate just watching it on my laptop Uh (laughs) and you know it gets to the scene this the 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 sex scene 69 scene yeah and i'm just like let me just turn the brightness down real low right (laughs) at this part but i will say i'm kind of thankful i watched it twice because i watched it the first time and i didn't really vibe with it sure i was like okay this is fine but nothing is sticking out to me as special or cronenbergian to to the little i know about him at this point interesting Uh uh-huh but on this rewatch i really dug it yeah like this is now my favorite cronenberg out of his movies which i feel like is an anomaly for him i'd say so yeah yeah i mean this sort of this sort of was like a diversion away from genre in a lot of ways like he you know, he follows this up with Eastern Promises. Which I want to see now, uh, now that I've seen this it's one. It's fantastic. Eastern Promises is really good. Mm. Eastern Promises, I, I, actually, after a rewatch on this, I might even venture to say Eastern Promises is better than this. I think, you're, I, I think I might agree with that, but I, I, it's been a minute since I've seen that one. Well, now I'm interested. So you haven't seen The Fly. I was just about to say, I haven't seen The Fly, which I know is like his claim to fame. It's great. And I will say, I have tried under various circumstances to watch scanners and whenever i put it on for some reason or another within the first 15 minutes i get pulled away to do something or something comes up yeah. so i feel like i haven't i have to give that one a proper watch too i'm gonna get through all these but well it doesn't help that the lead in scanners is absolutely an awful actor yeah that's a tough watch maybe that's what it is maybe i just get bored yeah very early on we actually we just covered cronenberg's first feature films shivers uh not too long ago oh and i tried watching that I tried watching that too, and for some reason I got distracted. For whatever reason, Cronenberg movies, I just get distracted and have to do something else. Well, (laughs) Shivers is a rough watch anyway, and yeah, it was pretty rough. (laughs) But I mean, I didn't get very far. (laughs) That's in his evolution of his career. I mean, he can kind of see in the in the beginning where he where he starts, kind of evolves into where he goes, but. As Nathan said, this movie was kind of a a departure from his regular sort of style. Mm -hmm. And he had just come off of Crash, which was kind of famous and controversial for... I want to watch that one, too. (laughs) A lot of people dislike that one. Of course, me being the fanboy, I I think it's pretty good. I like it. I... I love it for the performances more than any of the content, I think. And it's also worth it for that incredible uh, James Spader interview where like there's a roundtable interview where someone asks, you know, why is there no male frontal nudity? There's so much female nudity in this movie. (laughs) And James Spader in perfect Robert California fashion says, well, traditionally, when you're fucking, you can't see the penis. (laughs) Wow. Which is one of the most insane things I've ever seen anyone say in an interview. (laughs) I'll also say, too, I got halfway through um, another one of his movies, too. Mm -hmm. Again, for some reason, I get pulled away. I started watching Rabid. Okay. I have not seen that one. Rabid's his second film. It's a step up from Shivers, but it's still kind of low budget 
Canadian picture. Like, yeah. it, it, it feels a lot like Shivers, but it's definitely a step up from Shivers. You might dig Dead Ringers, too, mm. which I, I think is really good, but also very unsettling. Oh, it's it's great. Jeremy Irons is a ph- phenomenal in that movie. It's yeah. one of his best performances. Yeah. I'm interested to see that one, too. But with Rabbit, I put it on because my wife went to the grocery store with the kids. And I was like, I'll put this on. And then I, I thought I'd be finished with it before they got home. And then they did. And I was like, <laughs> sure. This seems like a movie I should probably stop while. <laughs> sure. Yeah. When the, when, the main, when the main star of the film is a porno actress, you mm-hmm. probably don't want to watch it with the kids. Yeah. 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 So, so I didn't get very far in that one either. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyways, so this movie, I really fucked with it on the second time. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate it a lot more. And we'll get, I guess, because my notes kind of varied with like how I remembered the movie being versus the second rewatch, it changed up a little bit. But sure. we'll get into all of that. Well, Josh, what was, uh, what was your first? Oh, no. I mean, my, my first experience yeah. with this movie is nothing interesting. So it's not really <laughs> uh, anything that I need to delve into. I, I don't even, it was just a rental and watch at the time. I didn't know it was a Cronenberg movie, didn't know who Cronenberg was. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing that really kind of appealed to me about this movie was the trailer that as nathan said kind of sets it up as an action movie almost sure. and uh in vigo mortensen like i've been a fan of vigo mortensen since texas chainsaw massacre 3 yeah <laughs> i watched that for the first time this year yeah it was what it was part of my 31 movies and he is really good in that movie he sure is yeah yeah, yeah. he's a he's a good replacement for bill mosley in that mm-hmm. in that if you were the last thing i saw before i died <laughs> <laughs> nathan and i have a soft spot for that one a yeah. lot of people don't like it but i i, I, I fucked with it yeah. i thought it was pretty cool it's one of the better sequels for sure yeah it's the one i watched the most when i was a kid yeah i know i i really liked it that speak and spell gag is so good so <laughs> fun, food. Funny. god god it was so good okay well let's let's get into uh for those who don't know all the details about uh, a history of violence so the year is 2005 this is what two or three years after uh return of the king yes right and this is indeed the return of the king. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. Viggo Mortensen's kind of a household name at this point. Uh-huh. So, as we mentioned, of course, director is David Cronenberg. The movie stars Vigo, Maria Bello, William Hurt, mm-hmm. Ed Harris, Ashton Holmes, Heidi Hayes, Peter M- McNeil, Stephen McCaddy, and Greg Brick, who is has a face of like I know that guy, and then <laughs> I didn't recognize much of his filmography. <laughs> Greg Brick is the he's the young killer, right? He's Billy. The, yeah, 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 yeah. He he favors Josh Safty a little bit. Oh, that's a good maybe call. that's what it is, especially with his beard, yeah. especially with his beard and that's in those IMDb photos. Yeah, yeah. The budget was thirty two million dollars, which feels like a lot for this movie. Yes, <laughs> it does. That's got to be salaries mostly, right? I guess because of. Vigo at that point. Yeah. Right? Vigo coming off Lord of the Rings. I mean, you got to pay that man some money. Yeah. He's making Hidalgo money now. <laughs> <laughs> and the movie managed to grow $61 million worldwide. So I guess it kind of broke even once you factor in marketing and all that good stuff. Sure. Currently sits at an 87% on Rotten Tomatoes. That's fair. And nominated for Best Supporting Actor for William Hurt. Yeah. For 10 minutes of scream time. <laughs> <laughs> and Best Adapted Screenplay for Josh Olson. Yeah, William Hurt is supporting actor. I'm not opposed to it, but yeah. it also... I, his performance... Uh, <laughs> He's making some choices. <laughs> some choices. Yeah, when I heard that he was nominated, I was like, he was nominated for this? Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, you guys keep talking about the trailer. I avoided the trailer since I had never seen the movie. So, this would be my first time seeing it. Yeah, I haven't seen it since I saw the movie. I remember it being a lot of, like, quick cuts, mm. right? This is like pre-John Wick. Yeah. Sort of, like, you think you're getting something like a John Wick movie, and it's totally not that. Got it. <laughs> well, they, yeah, they portray him firing off that shot in the diner as though he doesn't have a knife in his foot during it. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Like, it's a cool move. Well, I'm excited to see it. So, let's get into this trailer. Also, always happy to see that New Line logo. I love just, it. Every time. For some reason, love it. The most evil school bully? <laughs> oh, we'll get talk about that bully. Oh, God. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Stahl. Hey, Jared. Nick Stahl from Terminator 3? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Pat. Lots of... Fade ups and fade outs. Yeah, all shot, all shot in Canada. By the way, oh, of course. Good evening. God, how great is Stephen McCaddy? Like always. Hell, the ten minutes he's in this movie, he's great. Yeah. Oh, I know that. I do know that. Shut up. 
Oh, they had to cut that real quick so that bitch isn't in there. <laughs> yeah. So many. Oh, we're not counting the white flashes. Oh, yeah, we're not. Oh, or the black flashes at this point. Wow, yeah. What an oddly edited trailer. It's really weird. It's it's very early 2000s. Yeah, stylized, but not well. No, it's this is reminding me of the Fast and Furious trailer we just watched. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> There's so much. There's not a theme they're sticking with. There's no cuts to black. There's flashes. There's Dude, Ed Harris is just like Steve Martin in the fact that you can see him in something from '87 <laughs> all the way to right now, and he doesn't look like he's aged a day. <laughs> Absolutely. Joey, you tell me. Uh, this also. You remember the trailer for Drive was like this too. Was it? Yeah, Drive was nothing like the trailer and it encompassed it. Drive's trailer made it look like a hardcore car chase action film. This makes it feel like it's a horror movie. Yeah. And coming from Cronenberg, that might be what you were expecting. Right. Yeah. If you were if you were following Cronenberg at this time. He's so good at killing people. I have so much to say about Ed Harris's performance in this movie. <laughs> Yeah, this feels like it's like a Saw movie now. Yeah. Tell me the truth. What are you? What are you? <laughs> I'm Batman. I'm Batman. <laughs> At that point, it should be like, I've got an arm that's also a gun or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If it's Cronenberg, that's what we're doing, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, very, very weird. There was apparently a deleted scene uh, in, in which he has like a nightmare about killing Carl Fogarty and like yeah, blowing yeah. a hole in his chest. I saw that. Dude, that that is actually the first note yeah. that I wrote down is they cut the most Cronenberg scene out of this Cronenberg, Cronenberg movie. Mm. Which would have been him pulling a shotgun out of his chest cavity, right? And it was uh, the dream sequence is uh, uh, Tom or Vigo, Tom, Joey, whatever you want to call him in this yeah. movie. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom going. having a nightmare after the incident in the diner and he shoots Ed Harris with the shotgun blows him across the diner <laughs> and when he walks up to him he has a gaping hole in his chest you can see his rib cage and shit and he was in the behind the scenes stuff Cronenberg you can hear him on set talking about well I was going to have him pull a gun out of his chest and I'm not against like tooting my own horn because he did the <laughs> same shit in, in Videodrome right. but he's like I'm I'm not going to pay homage to myself even though I'm all for it yeah, I don't want to self plagiarize <laughs> well I I feel like it, at that point you're throwing out all the subtext of what you're trying to say. Totally. Like I, I get it. I get the whole uh, hereditary genetics, like of violence, passing it down. Yeah, yeah. I, I get, I get the metaphor. I don't need it to literally be pulling a gun out of your chest. I don't. But I, I also do like the t how the title can be interpreted multiple different ways yeah, right yeah. like like yeah it, roger ebert said the same thing oh really oh yeah. wow yeah literally we're talking about family thing. history and we're talking about the cycle of violence and yeah I, it's a it's a brilliant title even before you dive in yeah and it's great i will say i really wanted to bring back well not bring back necessarily but i did want to do the drink of the film this week okay but it is impossible to find jenny creams around <laughs> me because i looked I never had one. No, it me neither. Interesting. Well, your only option from there is black coffee because I think that's the, the only thing anybody else drinks in the movie is black coffee. <laughs> yeah, that this family drinks water with no ice at the dinner table, and yeah. it upset me. <laughs> yeah, some room temperature tap water. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At least it wasn't milk. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I expected milk with the uh -huh. prison food that they're eating at the end of this movie. Like, no offense to <laughs> holy shit. I'm assuming Maria Bello's cooking, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it looked those like, carrots. Yeah. looked like a hospital food. Like I, the, the meat. Loaf really <laughs> bothered me. It's uh, dry. It's so it's dry, you donkey. <laughs> I couldn't figure out if it was a meatloaf or a roast. I didn't figure out it was meatloaf until they moved it at the end. Yes. That's the same thing. When I saw it on the plate, I was like, what is this hunk of yeah. just brown? What is this? <laughs> she's is she serving them peas and a carrot cake? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love how peas and carrots are super, super green and super orange in movies. Yeah. Like, yeah. Unrealistically that bright. See, I took that as like, is this is he saying something with like this is like the traditional modern like the the family meal is sure. just the basics or is it just like I, I don't know I had a lot to talk about that meal at the end of the movie. <laughs> well we start we we kind of start with a meal at the beginning of the movie and I wanted to ask you guys like uh -huh. are the breakfasts that are the breakfast scenes at the breakfast table like okay I, I know uh, Dustin you have children I do and like <laughs> do you like 
sit around the table and eat breakfast together and Not talk like all. everybody talks in the movies because right. I feel like nobody does that. No. Nope. No, but I mean, we barely have a kitchen table at this point. Every week, <laughs> I think our kitchen table is kind of, or the dining room table is kind of gone uh-huh. from the modern family yeah. like dynamic. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's just me. Maybe my family is not loving and we don't sit around and eat the same cereal multiple times in the uh-huh. episode. I don't know. I just, I feel like the, 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 the start of the movie breakfast conversation with families is almost a trope now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I guess we've just grown out of it as society and. It's just weird to watch that shit now because you're mm-hmm. like, nobody talks like this. Yeah. Nobody talks like this over breakfast. You're lucky if anybody talks to anybody at all. <laughs> See, I, I felt the same thing, but later on when uh, they first get back from the hospital and the da- the kid's like, you're a hero, dad. Maybe you can go on Larry King. And the mom's like, oh, stop it. I'm like, this feels like a play. Yes, I, I wrote that down. Yeah, there's bits in here where I'm like, this is Neil Simon's A History of Violence. Like, yeah. So, so at that point, I'm like, what is what is David Cronenberg, not, not to diminish his directing, but I'm like, sure. what is he doing? Because a lot of this movie feels like that. It doesn't have his typical body horror It's a lot of point and shoot, too, right? Yeah. Like, it feels yeah. very workmanlike for David Cronenberg. It almost feels like this should be like a, like a Ron Howard movie. Very sure. meat and potatoes, like... You, you get your very basic. And that's why I say I, I kind of felt a little different watching it this time. Yeah. Um, I remember enjoying it the first time I saw it. However, it wasn't really the movie I thought I was getting. But right. starting this movie, I mean, this entire first shot where you're following these two guys out of the motel yeah. is very quiet. Mm-hmm. And just sort of it's one shot until you get into the actual office. Yep. And by that point, you're like, it is it is masterful. Because by the point, by the time he finally walks in, you're thinking... I don't want to follow you inside right, because yeah. everything about the energy here is wrong. Mm-hmm. They, one of them comes out and says, I think I'm tired. Yeah. They both move like they're hurting. Yeah. Like they, 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 the, you know, Steve McHattie goes in, comes out, throws something away in the trash can. And then he says, Oh, just go get water from the office. And you're like, well, they don't work there. Yeah. So like w- everything about it just feels wrong. Yeah. And it's, it's such a brilliant opening scene. I, I loved this. Op- and in fact, this felt very proto no country yes. to me, this opening yeah. scene. And the kid the kid has to touch everything yep. as he walks through. Yeah, yep. I was getting vibes of no country for old men all through this movie. But it's funny you say that, Nathan, because my next note was dude's just putting his fingerprints on everything. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I love that little detail. He's like, let me because when we follow the camera, we see what he sees when he first walks in, right? Yeah. Which is Two dead people just behind the counter, covered in blood. He's looking at the postcards. Yeah, he's like he's playing with the phone. Let me see if there's any spare change in the payphone. Let me decide which drink I want. Ring the bell. Like I love those little details. Yeah, he had to get himself a mug root beer out of the refrigerator. Uh-huh. <laughs> they show mug root beer again in the movie later. I was like, they got a sponsorship from fucking Pepsi right here, buddy. Mm-hmm. They got a they got a sponsorship from Yingling too. That bar, there's Yingling all over yeah. the place. But here, here's my biggest beef, honestly, with the movie. Uh-huh. I do not like the score. Yes. At all. Uh, Howard Shore, too. I know. It's so, like, I think this opening scene would work so much better if there was no, no music, music yeah. at all. And then when they do choose to use music, there's, like, when Tom is in the hospital and they're wheeling him out in the wheelchair, it's almost playing music like it's, like, a low-key adventure movie. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. it's something you hear in The Lord of the Rings when, like, Frodo and Sam are just walking through the woods, like, nothing eventful is happening. Uh-huh. But, like, that's the kind of music you're hearing. And I'm like, this doesn't fit at all. No. It's this low-key like trumpet or whatever. And then you get a couple of, you get a couple of points in the movie too, where the, the, the score gets very like incendiary mm-hmm. and you're like, why is the music doing this right now? Yeah. Well, the, the, the bits of the score that work for me are the early scenes in the town when he's like walking to work. Sure. And it's very much like, bah, 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 da, da, da. <laughs> that like it's very yeah. like m- morning time. It's very warm and inviting. And that's, sure. that's what it makes sense. But And that's the stuff that sounds like a Ron Howard movie yes. where you're just like, oh, look, middle America. We're all fine here. I, I do want to say, though, I'm a little disappointed Mally's not here because, I mean, kid dies in the first five minutes of this movie. I <laughs> wrote that down. I was like, I, I know it doesn't beat it, yeah. but does this movie get a face off a run for its money? Because that kid is dead within. No, Mally would reject this because it's off screen. That too, and uh, it's still like I think it's still not going to beat it in terms of runtime. So, well, <laughs> off off screen or not, let me just make a, a comment right now. Yeah, the kid actors in this movie are both awful, awful, yeah, awful. awful. That girl standing in that doorway when he's going through that office, just stroking that doll's hair. I was like, this is not acting. This is a kid 
kid acting like she's acting. It's it's really bad. Yeah. And, and, I mean, not to disparage kid actors too much, but it does feel like... It's tough, right? It, well, it feels like Cronenberg's like, okay, you're going to open the door. You're going to see this man. Yeah. You're going to get uncomfortable and start to like whimper. But like, and again, it's just, she's just a young actress, which that's just the beat she took. I was like, right. okay, I got to hit my marks here. I got to do this. Right. And then, yeah, the, the daughter... Is just saying oof, those words. Oof, yeah. Well, I'm not just going to beef on children actors either. I'm also going to beef on actor actors because I feel like... Can I guess, wait, wait, wait. Can I guess who you're going to talk about first? Yeah, go go for it. <laughs> uh, are we going to... We got to talk about the son, right? Because the son, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesse, not Eisenberg. <laughs> yeah, pro, I wrote proto Jesse Eisenberg. <laughs> yeah. But uh, honestly, Vigo's performance oh. in the first 10, 15 minutes of this movie are are really like... I'll fight you on this. Okay. <laughs> I, well, will, th- I will fight you on this because for the first... I, I, this is... I, I think for the first 20 minutes of this movie, he is purposefully doing... He's got big Steve Zahn energy. Yeah. He's got the mu- the must up hair and he, he's sort of, you know, he, he, everything's fine, right? Yeah. Like, and it's sort of one note. I don't know if it was the direction or the dialogue or what, but it, I think it's it, both. It, it was not working for me. Okay. See, I think it works perfectly because by the, when you finally get that moment of, I should have killed you in Philly. Yes. It's like, that's someone fucking, that is a different human being. Yes. And it's, I love it. But that's why I say in the beginning of the movie. Sure. Yeah. Uh, because it does it does shift as we go through, but this whole opening with him ch- uh, checking on the daughter after the nightmare, and then yeah. every, the whole fucking family ends up in the room checking on this girl, singing her songs. Oh well, yes, th- this is this is when the movie's really laying it on thick. Yeah. Monsters aren't real. Yes. Everybody's got different advice for dealing with monsters. Uh, the mom kisses Jack on the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> like, a lot of why does this keep happening? This keeps uh-huh. happening in episodes we do this season. I know it's it's. Parents kissing their kids on the mouth and also slapping their children. That happens. And then, Car- and then Carl Fogarty says, I hope you find love. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and your shoes. Don't forget those too. But Sue, so I will take both of your points into consideration and say, yes, this opening scene with well not the opening scene but this, this first scene with Vigo and why does everyone come into this fucking kid's bedroom it's <laughs> it's so stilted it's it's from a different movie it's the uh it's like the heartwarming version of the something about Mary scene where sure, everybody, has to come, sure. <laughs> everybody has to come in and take a look but I will also like it it does fit with what they're trying to establish up front with this character they're trying uh-huh. to show you he's got this idyllic life in the midwest it's quiet nothing really happens like True. the most exciting thing that's happened to him is his daughter having a nightmare so that's why the whole family's got to come in sure so i agree with both of you <laughs> i pinpointed exactly what it was that got me about that scene okay. and, it's, and it's when everybody's in the room or it's it's when all the the boys are in the room with the with the daughter and the mom comes in and vigo's delivery of I was just telling Sarah that there are no monsters. Like the way he yeah. says it. Yeah. <laughs> that was no, a- you're, he's right. He's right. That is, it's bad. It's bad. It's a bad delivery, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, is it meant to feel artificial? Do you think? That, because like, I, that's what so. I think. I think, I think everything's supposed to feel fake and that's kind of the point, but... But that only works if the other actors are good around him, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. they're... It, because Jack doesn't feel genuine to me, and no. there's moments where Maria Bello also doesn't feel genuine to me, and I, I love Maria Bello. Oh, see, I'll fight you on that. I think Maria Bello across the board is crushing it in this movie. I, I think she's fantastic, I do, but there are a couple of... And it might... And I don't even think it's her performance, it's just there are lines of dialogue in this movie that are impossible to say. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And, and what I will say too is while I don't think the the Jack character, the son, is good, <laughs> I do think there is one moment where he really redeems himself in terms of his performance. And we'll mm-hmm. talk about when we get there. But I think, yeah, I think that, that scene with the bedroom, with the nightmare, it does feel like a play yeah. to keep harping on that because each person has to come in, have their introductory moment, right. uh-huh. and then join the rest of the family. Because uh-huh. it's Vigo, then the son, then Maria and I'm like how many people are in this family is the dog going to come in next it's like the opening of a Brady Bunch episode yes <laughs> yes yeah absolutely what's the matter Jan <laughs> <laughs> now remember when you tell on other people you're actually telling on yourself <laughs> <laughs> why did that sound like Batman from 69 <laughs> a little 66 bit. a little bit We got to talk about this actor that plays the son, though, um, because he has... Did you guys look at his filmography at all? I've seen him in something else. He seemed familiar to me, yeah. So here's the thing. He stars in this movie, right? A History of Violence. Yeah. He has also starred in not one, but two different unrelated movies, both called Acts of Violence. Oh, Hmm. interesting. So he's got 
He did Acts of Violence, then A History of Violence, and then another movie called Acts of Violence. Oh, weird. So I, I don't know what's going on with with that character or that actor. So. He was in What We Do is Secret, that movie about the germs. Oh, mm-hmm. I haven't seen that. He, was not a, he wasn't a main character, though. It feels like he's in other things and I recognize him, but I, I just didn't. I looked at his... Honestly, I, like you, you brought up Jesse Eisenberg earlier. If you're looking at his Wikipedia picture, he looks like the guy from What's Sunny, uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Oh, Glenn really? Horton, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he's 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 a big TV guy now. He's in Bosch. He's in uh, Revenge, NCIS Hawaii, yeah, Criminal Minds. I don't recognize him in much. Supernatural. No. He's in an episode. He he just does like little one offs, uh, like a character actor almost. I think the reason he looks so familiar is because he looks so much like Jesse Eisenberg. Yeah, that might be what it is, honestly. Yeah. But he's also like. 28 or 29 in this movie playing <laughs> question mark a 16 year old <laughs> i saw a note yeah. about that apparently maria bello is only 11 years older than this kid i, I believe that then it's fine that she kisses him yeah. i think <laughs> Not, i mean i'm kind of similar similarly related i watched i rewatched back to the future for the first time in a long time recently uh-huh. crispin glover is three years younger than michael j fox yes. wow uh so. yeah that was shocking to me. So it's hilarious. But yeah, everyone comes into this little girl's bedroom and it's it feels like they're just reading their sides like this was the rehearsal almost. <laughs> sure. But I do appreciate as as much as the performances do feel wooden in this opening bit of the movie. I do appreciate the small attempt at humor that this movie has. Yeah. Like when Vigo goes to his diner and this guy's telling the story about his ex-wife that <laughs> stabbed him and he's like, "Oh, and then I married her." Yeah, I thought that was <laughs> Very good law, a uh, very good little delivery with their with their one patron who comes there for every meal. Mm-hmm. Apparently, this is Bod's Burgers, and he's Teddy. Like he just shows up <laughs> yeah. every fucking day. <laughs> They're just telling stories about broads. I I kind of would love to have that dynamic though with a, a local restaurant like a sure non chain i did have it briefly but it was at a waffle house when i was a teenager like the waitresses knew me there but i would love to have that nowadays and i just i just don't i do there's something special about going into a restaurant that you've been into and people know your name sure and like they got your meal ready for you or whatever it's it feels it feels good double r <laughs> double r good. diner man <laughs> go get you a slice of pie my girlfriend was recognized at taco bell recently and oh. she was like i can't go back okay yeah I was gonna say, that's not that's not a good situation <laughs> No, it's got to be it's got to be a family old uh, non chain related thing. Otherwise, it's uh-huh. just embarrassing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, while, while I have been harping on the acting yeah. so far, uh, what we're in, I do like that they're establishing this small town dynamic and how small this town really is and everything. But mm-hmm. I will give this movie a kudos on how realistic their depiction of a sixty nine is. Okay, yes. let's talk about this now. So. Uh huh. <laughs> it's as awkward. It's it's always more awkward than you think. Right. Right. Um, I disagree, but we'll keep going. Uh, so here, here's here's the thing about this movie. I knew literally one thing about it before watching it, and yep. that's because for like it's talked up like. Oh, don't, don't you know there's a 69ing scene in a history of violence? And I was yeah. like, okay, well, I'm curious to see how they shoot that and get an R rating. Like, it's it's got to be interesting, right? Right. This is the most tame sex scene of all time that I've seen in a movie. <laughs> it helps that, like, Tom has the, you know, the scene in the room when they eat the chocolate and the guy gets the blowjob <laughs> on the couch? Yep. It's like that face. It he is. has that face. <laughs> it, it is very uncomfortable f- at first, but yes. it also feels real. Yeah. Right? Like, like he he doesn't know how to be sexy. Yes. He's like he keeps shifting on the bed, like he's trying to find a cute pose yes. for when she comes back into the room. Yeah, it's so good. And, and Maria Bello, like I imagine this would have to be very uncomfortable to film. Uh huh. Does a fantastic job with like the the cutesy ne- like nature of it. We don't yeah. have to be teenagers. Which is a line I don't understand, but well, <laughs> I, I think they have really well. They never got to be teenagers together. Right? That's, they didn't. They didn't my, meet until okay. they were adults. Yeah. Gotcha. I was gonna say that line confused me the first time. I was like, wait a minute, they didn't know each other when they were teenagers. What the fuck is she talking about? Right. That, that makes much more sense. It's so sweet, and I I think they have really great chemistry. They yeah. do. Yes. What well, What I would say though about. <laughs> the the sixty nine was I was a little underwhelmed I'm because sorry. again it's all it was always hyped up but that's yeah. fine because it played better sixty nine's always underwhelming my friend <laughs> <laughs> again I I disagree but we'll keep going I I will say because this is a David Cronenberg movie yeah. and there's no virtually no body horror in it yeah did you guys feel like this too because when they cut to the wide shot and they show that like the way their bodies are like contorted in that wide shot and with the lighting it yeah. did feel like this is like the closest we get to some 
body horn. <laughs> the 69 is the closest we get to body horn. The killer pretzel, we call it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the, I, this scene is is really great. I mean, it could so easily be just titillation for its own sake. Right. That's See, that's what I expected. I expected like hardcore stuff. But it's character work. Yeah, like, true. There, she accidentally throws his belt too hard when mm-hmm. she takes it off. Like, it's, mm-hmm. it's really funny. And then it's followed by this Nicholas Sparks-esque scene where oh, they're saying God. dialogue like, I remember the moment I knew you were in love with me. Uh. And I... I still think Vigo sells it, even though it's so cheesy. Yes. I even even like that, you know, she's wanting to read, like, have this high school, like, teenager era time with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even when he, you know, decides to start going down on her, she's like, there wasn't much of that in high school. Like, it's really just... That was a good line. I love that. (laughs) It's a good line. Yeah. But it also, this is where, again, the score makes me uncomfortable, because it's doing that little da-da-da. Like yes. it's, do, it's doing the little fluttery flute under it. And I'm like, what do we do? <laughs> no, I, you expect like take my breath away to start playing, or, or nothing, or nothing would have been better. Honestly, yeah, <laughs> no, I, that's what I mean. Like that score is so it feels so dated, right? Like, yeah, and it feels so it's such a like a chaste score for what this movie is. To add to that, I will say this movie feels like it's not going to be as timeless as it could be yeah. because the camera work in this movie is. Every the camera's right up in everyone's faces, which Lots is of close-ups. It feels like a TV movie a lot of the time. Yes, yeah. it's it. That's how we were making movies at the time. Like we were right up in everyone's. It, uh-huh. it looks very similar to like an M Night Shyamalan movie. Like yeah. that's what's weird about like the '90s and the early 2000s era movies and whatnot. And, oh, and notably, this was the last movie that one of the last movies that was mass produced on VHS. Mm-hmm. Yes, but I was watching my cousin Vinny with my wife the other day, and we were talking about. Um, Marissa Tomei's performance in that, and mm-hmm. she she won a fucking Oscar for that movie. Yes, yeah. she did. And I, I'm not surprised by that. I'm surprised by the fact that my cousin Vinny was nominated for Oscars. Like, yeah. right, my cousin Vinny doesn't seem like the kind of movie that would have been nominated for. There were also just less movies. Yeah. True. You know what I mean? Yeah. True. <laughs> well, I mean, what was it? Was it The Dark Knight that expanded Best Picture to from five to ten? Yeah, I think so. I yeah. think so. So, like, nothing surprises me anymore because then I look back at something like when David Ayer's Suicide Squad went up against one other movie for Best Makeup yeah. and won an Oscar. So Suicide Squad is technically a, an Oscar-winning movie. So Oscar-winning like, DC movie. Yeah. So fake tattoos impressed the Academy that much? Yeah. Appar- and I can't remember who the other person... It was literally one other movie. Uh-huh. But I, I'm going to look it up now because I remember being like, are we really going to do... Is this really what we're doing? What other movie is nominated? <laughs> wow. It, it ve- made me very angry. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but the scene that I noticed, the camera work and everything being really just poured honestly kind of basic yeah is the the baseball scene the first baseball scene yeah because it's just everything's so flat and the performance here is kind of wooden too and this bully (laughs) we gotta talk about this guy because my favorite part is this is first of all the easiest pop fly catch of all time Mm -hmm. of from kids little league to major base major league baseball this is the easiest (laughs) catch ever yeah for a game that potentially means nothing i mean they don't make any effort to say it's like a a league game or yeah or or anything for a championship or anything it's It's just just gym class yeah and this kid (laughs) this kid gets so steaming mad because he is his ball got caught like i'm gonna wreck this dude for the rest of his life well did did you guys get the feeling a few times like uh, this character was written to be younger. Like oh, yeah. Jack was meant to be like a middle school yeah, kid. Yeah. yeah. Cause like the, the, the stakes are so low here. And he, I mean, he runs out, you know, uh, he basically pulls an Andy Samberg. I have to go to my quiet place a couple of times uh-huh. in this movie. And it just, it, it, it kept feeling like this is written for a more juvenile performance. I don't know. Well, it was also a thing of like, he doesn't make, it's not like he had to run and like leap over the fence to catch this pop fly. He right. doesn't move. He just stands there, puts his glove up, and catches it. Yeah. He's like, it's like in the Sandlot. He just closes his eyes and holds his hand up, yeah. and he catches the ball. It's that old Pizza Hut commercial. <laughs> 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 And but then the bully's like, I guess you think you're hot shit, huh? I'm like, for what? Yeah, I could have right. caught that ball. And I, I could have been in the stands and caught that ball. Yeah, you want to go? <laughs> I got to pull it up here. So Suicide Squad beat. Uh, there was two other movies. I'm so sorry. Star Trek Beyond, which I automatically think would, should win it over Suicide Squad. Sure. For Idris Elba's makeup alone. Yeah. And A Man Called Ove, which I've actually seen in oh. low-key makeup in it. But better better than Suicide Squad. <laughs> Interesting. Huh. So three movies nominated for makeup out of all the movies that year. We only got three in Suicide Squad quad one so huh anyway we get a lot of f-bombs in this movie sure in a very cringe way of this uh son trying to turn it around <laughs> like 
I don't know. I'm not. A, I'm not that big of a physical bully. But if I was going to, and this kid was like, "Uh, why are we fighting? It feels cruel. Like you already proved your point." I'd be like, "Well, now I'm. Now I have to hit. You. Now I have to beat your ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Now I have to hit you on principle. Yeah. Yeah. Now I. Uh, I was listening to to Freedom the other day, and Paul F. Tompkins was saying, "You know what would be great is if we started teaching our kids to pretend they love getting beat up. Like, <laughs> can you imagine? Imagine being bullied, and you're just like, "Yeah, give it to me. I want more of it. Yeah. You'd never. They'd never mess with you again." Uh, <laughs> Or they'll call your bluff. <laughs> it's one of the two things. Well, Nathan, I wanted to ask you, uh-huh. I was getting major Twin Peaks vibes from a lot of the stuff in this movie. Did you get any kind of Twin Peaks sort of feeling watching this? Honestly, only with the school stuff, because I felt like this is, you guys are overreacting so much to what the, the, the what is happening here. Yeah. yeah I mean, the, the bully kind of feels a little bit like Billy a little bit. Totally. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, other, otherwise, yeah, that was, that was about it. And maybe it's just the fact that we spend a, a little bit of time in a diet in this that yeah. I'm making those connections but yeah sure. of course the coffee and the pie too that goes with that yeah yeah I, I, not, and not to harp on it too much but of all the Cronenbergs I've seen this is definitely him at his most restrained mm. and I appreciate it but it also feels like it's missing something yeah like, if you continue with the filmography there's some there's some a lot more restrained films but really this, okay yeah like uh, uh cosmopolis was a tough watch oh that's the one that that Malik keeps recommending i watch is it just a tough watch because it's boring well i mean i found it boring i've only seen it once so okay. it's not a cronenberg movie that i go back to a lot that was the movie that turned me around on robert pattinson though. oh true his performance in that is very good yeah gotcha. See, so that was good time for me it was right after all the twilight shit so it. it was kind of him starting to move out of that <laughs> yeah it, that was sort of his like Oh, no, I mean, I'm an adult yeah. anyway. <laughs> but there's also a dangerous method, which I haven't seen, and partly because it looks like it's going to be a slog to watch. Yeah. Got it. Um, but no, I, I, I agree, though. Like, I think Josh nailed it when he said this feels like uh, a TV movie, right? Like, yeah. there's there's not a whole lot uh, ha- happening. It's a lot of static shots. So so, th- so that's how I felt on the first watch. Okay. And I, I can acknowledge all this stuff, too. Like, yes, it feels static, and some of the stuff feels wooden, but... I think it fits for the themes of the movie. Like Where I nothing think, happens. Like yes. nothing happens in this town. Yeah. 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 I can see that. Well, not only that, but like you hear a title like a history of violence. You're expecting some John Wick stuff, but all the <laughs> sure. violence, which we're about to get to in this diner scene, feels so authentic. Yeah. And that, this I do like because he, he's never, it, yeah, it's never flashy. It's no. what can I do to put someone down? Yeah. And as exciting as you it is to finally be like, yeah, the hero's getting the bad guys. It is uncomfortable to watch like it never feels like a triumphant moment no it feels like you're almost you want him to succeed in stopping these bad guys but at what cost like yeah we'll get to it but when he has to any movie like this you would expect like oh he's just gonna like now become a badass now that he's been exposed sure and he kind of does but not successfully not flashily in jolts i mean there's a bit when he snaps a guy's neck and then just runs like he's like i don't i don't it's not for the kill and he kind of puts his he kind of puts his hands up like oh like it's gross i didn't want to fucking do that like yeah yeah. like it's icky (laughs) yeah Yeah. and for all the shit that i'm given the movie so far with the acting and Uh and how 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 it feels and the tone they're setting up here let's make no bones about it vigo mortensen's great in this movie so good yes so Good. Fantastic. All of this shit that I'm bitching about is really setting up where we go in this movie. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Well, there's there's one part in particular I'll talk about, but I want to save it when we get there that I was okay. just like, uh, uh, about the violence in particular. Okay. So while we're at this diner scene, I, I want to ask two questions to you both. Mm-hmm. We're going to do a quick poll here. <laughs> First of all, the, e- the easier one, lemon meringue pie, yay or nay? How do we feel? Yay. Yay? Okay. Um, It has to be very specific yes yeah. it has to be very specifically yep. made but like my my great grandmother i was literally just talking about this today because it was a thanksgiving <laughs> staple i brought it up yesterday with my bobs <laughs> but my my great grandmother made a lemon meringue pie that to this day nothing has ever even approached being as good yep yep josh how about you i can't give an opinion never had a slice of the blooming meringue pie oh okay so honey come come by for thanksgiving i'll pull you off a plate <laughs> <laughs> i will say though i feel like there is a better scene in a movie with a lemon lemon meringue pie oh boy oh boy fear and loathing in las vegas oh, oh sure okay. <laughs> sure okay. sure sure well 
So uh, two things. One, I had a similar conversation. My my mom, I'm going to see to her for Thanksgiving, and she was like, "What would you like me to make you? Is there anything in particular?" And I'm, uh-huh. I had just watched this movie, and I was like, "God, I haven't had liberated pie in so long." And she makes a great one. Yeah. So I was like, "Can I have one of those, please?" And they're so, tough to make too, because mm-hmm. like they might not set. Mm-hmm. Like, but they're yeah, they're so good. Oh, she makes a, she makes a great one. Hell and yeah. on the flip side of that, I have had store bought like. Uh, in the frozen section, the marine, and it's it doesn't it's it's not worth it. It's, no, just, the, just get a fresh one. <laughs> the closest thing you can come to is uh, the Marie Callender's has like a key lime pie, but it's uh, still not quite there. I like a key lime pie too. I'm more of a key lime guy Same. than a lemon meringue guy. Definitely, so. I'm I kind of am excited for you to have your first lemon meringue pie at some <laughs> point though, because that's it's it's an underrated pie. It's an underrated pie. We'll bring you back on the show for a mini episode just to talk about it. Yeah, I'll eat lemon meringue pie live on the silver linings playlist yeah <laughs> you joke but i kind of would do that <laughs> <laughs> i'm down i'm down i'll let you know so here's the the tougher question yeah which would you guys rather have uh happen to you oh no kitchen knife to the foot uh-huh or coffee pot to the face <sighs> oh fuck uh-huh uh, i'll go first on this one i'm gonna have to say knife to the foot yeah. because yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, ha- I've had a similar situation Ooh. um I, I i stepped on a nail that went straight through my foot one time oh, oh you went full daniel stern with it okay <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna kill that kid <laughs> or or i guess the more contemporary response would be uh emily blunt yeah, sure too. yeah one <laughs> of the two uh, speak, speaking of Quiet Place, by the way, this town <laughs> that the diner's in looks like the town from a Quiet Place. It does. <laughs> it does. It does. Um, yeah, I, I would say I would say knife to the foot because, like, I'm just thinking of not only is that pot scald that coffee scalding hot, yeah. mm-hmm. but that pot, that pot segments into his head. Yeah. Uh, bleh, yeah, we get some great Cronenberg s gore here, though. Oh, yes. yeah, like it wouldn't be Cronenberg without a close up of an exit wound, Ooh, right? <laughs> no, when he hits him with that coffee pot, oof. Yeah. I, I, I feel the weight of that so hard. Mm-hmm. But I guess I have a question too. Yes. This is Billy and then the, the shaved head guy who I didn't get his name. Yeah. So they're part of Ed Harris's group? They're not. So that's the confusing part. Yeah. No, these are just these are just two other people. Uh, according to Stephen McHattie, he said that they like came up with backstories for their characters where I think they were a father and son oh, on I the don't road buy, just I don't killing buy that people. At all. I don't buy that either. But I heard something similar, but it was the younger guy had just gotten out of prison or something like that. That's what it was. Okay. And they, maybe they like bunked together. Yeah. So I thought they were part of Ed Harris's group because it makes it seem like they have an agenda. Right. Like they're because I thought what they were doing, which was insane, is literally driving across America to like every small town looking for people. Just Mortensen. killing people. Yeah. yeah. I, I truly thought that's what it was. And I was like, that's insane. Well, it's like that. Uh, was it? What was that movie? Was it Blue Blue Caprice? Oh, I don't know. Have you guys seen that? No, I, I think I think there's a movie that's sort of like that where it's it's actually a father and a son go drive across the country and they they just murder people they have like they they have a gun and they sniper people oh wow, wow. okay it's uh talk amongst yourselves i'll find the information about okay. it okay <laughs> that sounds terrifying i i mean but yeah it is it is odd they are unrelated to ed harris's outfit they are just two killers that's what i love about it going yeah. town to town and the fact that they pick that diner is why uh tom's life unravels yeah yeah, yeah. well I actually have a point about that too in just a second, uh-huh. but the, the Billy with the wiping her spit off on her shirt and then smelling it, really, uh, uh, yeah, uh, really creepy, <laughs> real creepy. That was uh, not ad libbed, but the, the 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 actors both discussed it and decided that that's what they were going to do in the scene. It wasn't in the script. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay, yeah. well, it's a good. It works. Yeah. It's real gross. <laughs> I, I I do love the like the move of so these two guys come in they're being real aggro for no reason and uh tom just says you know charlotte why don't you go on home mm-hmm. like he he's like he I, knows it's coming he, he will he either he either thinks this is gonna be really ugly or they're just gonna be rude so i'm gonna let everybody else head home and i'll yes. deal with them that's a good manager yeah right, right. well and in, in, in today and like if you were to chili's you'd be like uh go <laughs> and get, get, get these guys some coffee like, <laughs> yeah, right right you ain't going home <laughs> So, t- to your point, though, about Tom's life unraveling because of this, I do find the most interesting part of this movie is what it has to say about glorifying acts of violence, uh-huh. whether it's self-defense or just pure, plain evil shit. Like, Everyone keeps calling him an American hero. Yeah. Yes. And by doing that, they are putting a target on his back. They put him a, a target on his back, but they also put this, because everyone in that room is just like, this is the grossest, most awful thing we've ever seen. Yes. But everyone outside of that room is, it's
it's amazing that you they put him on a pedestal for obliterating these two. Yes. Well, and two two points to that too. One, Tom doesn't think of himself as a hero. No, no. he just did what had to be done. You know, in his in his eyes. Well, that's if we're if we're gonna get down to it, he's not a hero, right? Like, right. Yes, he he tries to defend himself, but the acts of violence are what ends up saving the day. But right. that's not a heroic feet right That's well right just- i mean we 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 don't know who this guy is like right. yes we think we think we do but we don't like yeah. what what got him ex- in this exact situation that he's in is all the violence he committed when he was younger like exactly it's, yeah it's a heroic moment in that he does save the other people in the diner but i can't imagine any human being doing what he does in this movie and feeling good about it exactly. you know what i mean and he doesn't and i think they portray that very well i, I think so I, there's never a moment where i feel like he thinks he's done something great he doesn't want to talk to the reporters. Yep. He he like doesn't want to look at the newspaper. He turns off the television. He's wincing when he sees himself on like every channel. And part of that is, yeah, he, he knows, okay, someone's going to see this. But I think another part of it is... Well, is it that? I think I think the big part of it is that he doesn't he doesn't feel good about it. He hates that he did this. I, see, I think it's I think it's more so that because yes, I would agree with you potentially that maybe he's like, oh shit, someone's going to see this and then come find me. Yeah. But he, I think he truly believes. Yeah. Up until Ed Harris comes to the house and kidnaps his son, that he is not this Joey guy yes. that, he's, that they're looking for. I yeah. truly believe that. Like he, he's he's left that behind. Yeah. completely. Well, I think he's wiped his memory of it because, like, oh, I don't, I don't know about that. Well, because well, see, when, that's go ahead, Josh. I'm glad you brought that up, Dustin, because like that's the thing. That we're we're talking about this movie, having seen it and knowing the outcome of the movie. Right. Mm-hmm. Imagine watching this for the first time, knowing absolutely nothing about it. Well, that was me. Like when when he gets. To the part where he finally says, I should have killed you in Philadelphia. I, for the whole movie, I'm like, holy shit, maybe this guy is not this Joey guy. Maybe Ed Harris did just get it wrong. And honestly, I think that's what drew me into it in the trailer and whatnot was like, oh, I'm kind of, I kind of want to see if this guy really is or if they've got a mistaken identity situation going on. And that's why I I think that he, because he... Whenever Maria Bello comes to the hospital yeah. and she's like, so wh- you got to tell me the truth. And he says, I am telling you the truth. I killed Joey yeah, or I got rid of Joey. Like he doesn't say, you know, I got rid of that identity. I got rid of that name. He thinks that's a totally separate person. Yeah. Well, I think he looks at it as a separate person. That's but I, what I, I don't mean. Think, yeah. I don't think that he necessarily has forgotten that he's Joey. I, I should rephrase it then. I don't think that he's forgotten that Joey is a person that existed. I think he is completely white. He's dissociated. Yeah, yeah. That and and not like a mental condition. Like he just repressed it so hard that he's like, that is a separate person. That is not me. I think that's yeah, I think that there's a lot of yeah, I think that's valid. I mean, there's a moment where Fogarty says, like, you've been you've been jo- you've been Tom almost as long as you've been you, yeah. right? Isn't that yeah? And so he's he's he says, like, you almost believe your own bullshit, don't you? Right. Wait, but but I think he does. <laughs> no, I, I yeah, that that makes sense. And William Hurt's got Probably the best line of the movie to me when he says, "When you dream, do you dream as Joey or do you, you know, do you dream as Tom?" I love that line. Yeah, that's a great line. And I'm like, I don't know if he knows an answer to that question. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, I think, yeah, that's a really great way of looking at this. Hey, may- maybe he got the same treatment that uh, the guy from Old Boy got at the end of Old Boy. <laughs> yeah, like, sure. Yeah. You know, yeah, maybe Maria Bello is his sister or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> One of my favorite lines in this exchanges in this movie, though, is he gets home. That reporter asks him, you know, how did it feel, uh, you know, uh, to to kill these two, you know, men, mm-hmm. and he just goes, "Not very good." Yeah, and she <laughs> keeps holding the microphone out, and he, as though she like isn't satisfied, he goes, "Not very good." Yeah. like <laughs> it's like, did you not hear me? Like, yeah. the amount of news coverage, and I mean, that was my note writing this down when the, right. as I was watching the movie was the amount of news news coverage this guy's getting is insane. But that also plays into how small this town is yeah of course it, it does but it also plays into the fact that this is 2005 before our news cycle was literally dominated by a new mass shooting every single fucking day true you know like well, there's it, th- there's that and then there's also this is right after 9 11 this sure. is like the height of patriotism good old boy exactly you stand your ground yeah. exactly yeah so 
yeah, it, it, it t- this movie was made at the perfect time. So, But doesn't it seem like these guys got into town really fast for it only being like this local news coverage? Like, I, I yeah. did think that, yeah. Because yeah. they're they're in Philly. I, I think they're supposed to be in Indiana or something like yeah. that. That's not just a hop, skip, and a jump. That's, right. a, that's a ways, you know? Yeah, I think he says he drove 15, 16 hours between the two states. So right. it's yeah. like a full day's drive. Well, and Tom also mentions, you know, that he he's like, he's sure the news cycle will move on pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think there's another Cronenberg movie happening off screen. Cause he mentions like the, you know, maybe the Leidens will have another two headed cow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I <noticed> that. yeah. <laughs> want to watch that movie. We also got to talk about one other thing too. Joey is unfortunately not a very intimidating name. No. And they say it a lot in this movie. And, not only Joey, but yeah. then you couple that with the last name Cusack. Yeah. Cusack. I can just uh, all I can see is John Cusack. Yeah. from that point on. Yeah. Well, I think it's I think it's also very calculated in that Joey is the coolest name you could have. Ed Harris doing a Frank Sinatra impression, saying. <laughs> well, every time he says it, it's like a growl. He's like Joey. Yeah. Like there's a lot of J in that word. Joey. Sure you do, Joey. Yeah, it's Joey. They say the name Joey a lot. How come <laughs> he's so good? killing people like it's it's it is a frank sinatra he's like in the rat pack like it's so good he is he is grinding his teeth as he's delivering each line oh this is this is his preamble for the man in black in westworld man. yeah like it's 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 almost the same damn character yeah i think the prosthetic guy looks pretty cool it's yeah. great i do love that if you're not going to order anything and i'm like but well, he did order something he, he ordered, ordered a coffee, coffee so it's not nothing now i'm a paying customer yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a performance <laughs> for sure it is a performance imagine this guy walks in and you think it's a reporter uh-huh. absolutely not uh-huh. the devil just came in <laughs> <laughs> i kind of would like to see an alternate cut of this movie where Viggo Mortensen is not Joey. Like it's, that does seem like it would be fascinating, right? Uh, yeah, because that it, it would be like a North by Northwest situation. Where oh, like, yeah. you sure. got the wrong guy. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's one of my next notes. Was I think he does a great job convincing us that he's not Joey. Yes. Like, I, until he says, I should have killed you in Philly. Yes. I really don't believe that he's Joey. I, I Same. The first time I saw the movie, I was like, well, maybe he's not this guy. And then that line is a bombshell. Yeah. Like that switches the movie. Because he seems so genuine throughout all of it mm-hmm. until that point. Mm-hmm. So they call Marie Bellicose the local sheriff. Yeah. And it's not him. But I had to look it up immediately after. Because for the longest time <laughs> during this movie, I thought this sheriff was Falcone from Batman Begins. <laughs> oh, funny. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tom Wilkinson. Yes. I thought it was him. It's not, but... No, it's very uh, <laughs> Peter McNeil, a, a, a sort of stock actor for uh, Cronenberg mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. He's good, though. He's very good. Oh, he's great. I mean, he's so sweet. I mean, he has these... You know, th- this also emphasizes, like, the small town vibe, mm-hmm. but, like, he knows them both by name. He's giving them hugs when he sees them, uh-huh. and they're all calling each other by their first name, mm-hmm. and you see it breaks his heart to finally tell, you know, Tom, none of this is adding up. Yeah. Well, he's got a very good line and a very good point, too, which is... These guys are very secretive. Yeah. Right. Uh, they would not come out here unless they were dead sure you were their guy. Yeah. They wouldn't come here on a hunch. Yes. Right. Exactly. And the thing is, is it, it, the performance seems a little cartoony at first, but that whole scene right there with the three of them talking yeah. and Maria Bello kind of putting on that performance for him. Ooh. But as soon as he walks out the door, you know that sheriff doesn't buy their bullshit. Dude. Yeah, absolutely. Even though he lo- like he, he kind of walks out with that resent, like he's like, I love these people, but I know they're lying to me. Yep. You know, she was, well, she says, haven't we suffered enough? And he sort of laughs and just goes like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Like you're, you're really going to pull that on me yeah. Yeah. after everything. Yep. It's a chess game. Yeah. Like, but <laughs> as good as that stuff is, I, when, uh, she calls the sheriff, the sheriff comes by and says, ah, they're, they're bad guys, but they seem to be like they're leaving town. And then, uh, he leaves and Marie Bella says something like, it's either her or Vigo, but they say it's over and done with. <laughs> and then I, I had headphones on the second time watching, so I noticed this, but there is a distant sound of thunder, and I was like, come on. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, I yeah. totally missed that. Yeah. Oh, I was man. like, come on, man. That's funny. <laughs> and it should be noted, like, right here is where the deleted scene of the dream okay. would have been. Oh, okay. Because okay. I will say, watching the movie now without that scene in it, there's a weird cut there because he's in the diner by himself really early in the morning. The next morning, yeah. And it's like, why? Like, 
it's almost like he planned to be there. Mm -hmm. Like that's the moment where things start to turn a little bit because you're like, why? Yeah, if he if he thinks they're gonna go to the house, why go to the diner? Yeah. 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 My favorite thing about this sequence, I mean, I I do love him running down the road. This shit. (laughs) This. This. I thought of Kung Pao, man. I thought of Forrest Gump. I was like, what the fuck is he's limping and how? Okay, we but we know very little of the geography of this town. Uh huh. It is at least miles yes. away from where they live. It certainly looks like their house is 30 miles away from downtown. He <laughs> cannot breathe, but yeah, they live at April O'Neil's house uh, from Ninja Turtles, and like, he, he can't fucking breathe by the time he gets there. He says, get the shotgun, and they're coming to the house. My favorite thing about this scene is he busts in, uh-huh. she's got the gun trained on the front door, uh-huh. the son is in the next room just eating his breakfast, and uh-huh. that's when he realizes something's going on. And I'm like, your mom's crouched in the corner with a fucking gun <laughs> and you're just having your Captain Crunch? That's honestly Ashton Holmes' best performance point piece in this entire movie is him just holding the spoon with yeah. the milk dripping off of it as all this shit's happening in yeah. front of him. Oops, all guns. Well, it's also like, Vika, what are you doing? You should definitely announce yourself. You know, you told her to get the shotgun. Like, uh-huh. Nathan, you said, oops, all guns. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, I said, I did. And then Raphael's up in the upstairs bathtub, you know, cleaning up a little bit. What's the guy gotta do? to get some food around here. He wants food! <laughs> food. Get him some food! Uh, but no, Maria Bello fucking ride or die, motherfucker. Like, he, he says, one time, get the shotgun, and her immediate response isn't, what are you talking about? It's just, yeah. uh, she just says, what? Like, make it sure. Like, is this what you, yeah. is this what I need to do? And then immediately just, yeah. ride or die, dude. Love that. Absolutely. It. I love that. Honestly, this is the Maria Bello I needed in Prisoners. Oh, not the wow. Maria, yeah. Maria Bello that was in Prisoners. See, I agree, but I love that performance in Prisoners. Yeah. No, it's no, good. I'm not saying it's a bad performance. I'm just saying, like, that's how angry she needs to be sure. in Prisoners. <laughs> is that angry? Well, I think Hugh Jackman's angry enough for both of them. In the- oh, God, dude. <laughs> well, I was about to say, if this Maria Bello she Shared the screen with that Viola Davis, Paul Dano would be dead by the 30 minute uh-huh. mark. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> she would have shot him herself with that yeah. fucking double barrel shotgun. Yeah. I actually think Ash, the 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 kid, the Ashton Holmes, that's his name. Uh-huh. He, his best moment in this movie is when is when Vigo Morton he asks him what to do if the guys come back. Mm-hmm. And Vigo Mortensen says, Then we deal with it. And he just has this little flinch. Yeah. Like he just like like he's like, Oh, okay, well, that's just what we like. You're just going to keep murdering people. See, that's good, but I think he's got an even better scene coming up. Okay. In just a little bit. And actually, to couple with that, not for nothing, but Tom does seem like a really good dad. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This older son just cannot accept it. He keeps poking and prodding this guy who's been through quite a lot. Yeah. And is now the family's in danger. And I mean, honestly, I might have smacked him around too a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like... Your dad it seems like the gold standard for dads yes. at this point. Like, but, yeah. I mean, you also have to think about the fact. I mean, we're not quite there yet, but I mean, this his dad is not who he thought he was. Sure, but like, not to an ex- like. There's no hard evidence other than he defended himself. Like, yes, it almost felt like a John Wickian kind of response, mm-hmm. but. I don't know. I, I found it very, sh- the, the relationships are very strange. Yeah. Like the dynamic. Yeah. When he has that, so when he's like, are you going to have them hit me too, dad? Uh, like put a head out on me too, dad? Like See, that. That's the scene I'm talking about. Yeah, that scene I think is the, his best performance. It's good. The performance is good, but I'm sitting there going, kid, you don't know shit about what's going on right now. Like, True. I, I also like that he, when he's beating that bully up, he's crying while he's, he sounds like See, he's about to cry while he does it because it is just this release of anger. Like, I don't know. I, that felt real to me. That scene, I feel like, is maybe the worst of his performances. Well, see, I, I don't know. I, I was it, laughing. It felt genuine to me. My problem is that I don't know that the bully needs to be in this movie. No. Uh, that whole storyline I could do without. I get what it's trying to do, though, with, like, passing down the violence. Right, yeah. right. I don't think this actor, unfortunately, can do yeah. that much heavy lifting. I think the intent of the scene is good. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is, I mean, he's he's so, he's so anti-violence before he figures this shit out about his dad right yeah and then it's like oh does this make does it make it okay now can i fight these bullies like yeah it's a very it's a very weird sort of dynamic that shifts right there you know what else is weird is this mall all knickknack stores it felt like it (laughs) right like it's certainly this was some weird canadian mall which just just knickknacks they're like at a flea market or something yeah i absolutely love how maria bello just kicks the shoes off when she's Uh in the store she's like fine (laughs) no i gotta go get my fucking daughter yeah bro (laughs) 
so this this reveal that Ed Harris is sitting on the bench uh-huh. would play so much better if the score wasn't so distracting because it's that same kind of fluttery yeah. music. And I'm just like, man, it would be like a horror movie yeah. when he's right there. And I love Maria Bello not taking this guy's shit uh-huh. and up to him. But Ed Harris in that scene is fucking frightening. Yes, yeah. when he takes those glasses off. Yeah. We find out it's fucking barbed wire that did that. Oof. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it took my eye out with barbed wire. Uh. My, no, the line, my maybe my favorite line of the movie is uh, the eye still works a little. Yeah. The only thing I see is Joey Cusack. Yes. That's so good. That's yeah. what I was about to say. That that line is like haunting, man. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the don't forget your shoes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's good. It's really Really yeah, good. Yeah. So let's talk about this bully scene now because we cut to that. Uh-huh. And there, I got a lot of notes for this scene alone because, first of all, this kid goes right to a dick kick to this side bully. I would too. I thought that was pretty good. Good move. But yeah, this this bully gets his ass beat, which I love. Yeah. And again, watching with headphones on the second time, that last punch he leaves him with is heavy. Yeah. yeah. You hear bones break with that yeah. punch. It is thick, yeah. which I really appreciate it. But. When he's got the line of like, are you laughing? Are you laughing now? Oh, no, like, the dialogue is, not- is bad, oh, for sure. That's what I'm talking about. Like, I, this kid couldn't, he couldn't perform it very well. It yeah. just felt so flat. I How it. sexy am I now, fucker? <laughs> <laughs> it, need, it needed a fucker. It, it, it is so, like, cathartic, though. Yeah. And, I, and maybe that's because, you know, as I've uh, as I've mentioned a few times, uh, <laughs> I <laughs> dealt with shit mention. like this in school. I've tried to mention this. I dealt with this. I'm cool as fuck now. Uh, but I, I got I got <laughs> bullied in high school. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I don't know. They're, they're, I did sort of. When I watched this the first time, I was like, "Yeah, he's just like me for real." <laughs> hey, this this is your Batman. This kid. <laughs> no, this yeah, is yeah. classic Spider Man. This is Flash Thompson trying to beat pa- Peter Parker up yeah. in school. Yeah. I wouldn't want to fight me neither. <laughs> we should have had Joe Manganiello in this movie too. Oh, they're going to say on the podcast. I'm like, yeah, we should have. Let me call him right up. We should. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, Deathstroke, are you busy? <laughs> and what's up? What's up on a Liquid Death sponsorship while you're here? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he goes back to his house and he's like, "Yeah, they, they had the we don't uh, solve problems in this family by by hitting them. No, we just shoot them. Pretty good line. Yeah. And then yeah, Vigo smacks him around a little bit. Yeah. Which dude isn't fair? Isn't right. fair for? I'm like, he doesn't know anything about him at this point. He doesn't know his. Well, I mean, not, well, okay, no, I'm sorry. He does know that he was. He's not who he says he was. But still, like, but he suspects at least. He obviously was defending himself in the diner. Like yeah, it right. was an obvious defense sort of thing but the way he says it to him then it's just like this kid's just being a you know letting out some teenage aggression sure. because that is not what you would say and that was how his first couple of scenes are right like he's ha- he has these sort of like little snide comments that he makes at the dinner at the breakfast table yes. yeah and and i think you get the feeling that tom has just let it fucking slide yeah. like they have never argued yes the entire time jack has been alive right and this is the first time that tom has been like hey you little shit <laughs> oh yes because well it's it's not even the of the fact that he fought this kid, put him in the hospital, whatever. Yeah. I, almost as a dad, but like, look, if you're getting picked on to that level of extent and, you know, violence is being threatened, you have to defend yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And he, sa- he, and he tells him, he says, you can stand up to him. You don't put him in the fucking hospital. <laughs> yes. Th- that's not the part that bothers me. It's when he says, you know, we, we can't afford to do this. Like, we have to get an attorney. And he's, and we, you know, Maria Bello's an attorney. He goes, oh, what? So mob's not going to take the case? Yes. I said to myself, I was like, look here, you little shit. And then right as I said that, he goes, look, Listen here, smart man. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like it was, I don't know, my fatherly instincts kicked in right there. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that line really, uh, really poked, a, uh, poked me in the side. I didn't like it. I didn't like that. <laughs> so that's when Ed Harris comes to the house. Turns out he's got Jack, because Jack ran away, I guess. Went to his quiet place for some punch dancing in the woods. <laughs> yep. So this is the part I was talking about where, like, the violence, it is him defending himself, but... I don't know how to describe it. It's like, I want him to succeed in protecting his family. But the part that gets to me is the nose bone to the fucking brain yeah. multiple Ooh, times. That, it's, oh my God. That effect is unbelievable. First, it's a throat chop. Yeah. Then it's a broken arm. Yes. And 
you know, in movies, like fighting movies, it's like, oh, one, you know, you hear it all the time about, oh, just punch the nose, bro, to the brain. Mm-hmm. But yeah. It's not easy to kill a human being. Like, no. you got to do that multiple times. And he's not going to feel his hand by the time he's done. Right. His hand's probably broken at that point. Like, and, it's, ugh. But it's also, so Fogarty tells Tom to put the gun down and he smiles when he does it because mm-hmm. you can almost feel him thinking, okay, I'm going to kill this guy in a way worse way. Like, yeah. that's, I don't have my tools. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and if that's the part that feels real with the violence, yeah. like, and, and then, you know, him getting shot in the arm and man, when he drops that, I should have killed you in Philly. It, it, you almost expect a bomb to drop right then. It's, He's a fully different character. When yeah. He, yeah. Jack shoots Fogarty, oh blood my God. explodes oh. <laughs> all over, all over Tom's face. That shot that just lingers on Tom. Yeah. And his, his facial expression just... I don't think it changes much. He becomes the Green Goblin. Like yes. it's he's he's got this his eyes somehow become colder. Yeah, and he's got a snarl on his face even as he's bringing his kid in for a for a hug. Yeah, like it is. He is a. This is an animal that we're looking at. I also don't want to just glide past the fact that Ed Harris gets a fucking a hole put in him. Like, <laughs> oh my yes. god, shotgun to the back. He explodes. Jesus, oh, it's so good. Yeah, and, and if you think that was bad, you should you should go back and try and find that deleted scene. It's way worse. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I might have to after this. I think I'm it's a, on the Blu-ray. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna I'm look it up on YouTube. I think if it's available. <laughs> and so yeah, they're at the hospital and. Another part that feels real to me is Maria Bello immediately vomiting. Oh, yeah. Because his response isn't, you're right, I am, I, Joey is my real identity or whatever. I it's, thought Joey was gone. Yeah, it's, I didn't do that. Joey did. And she's <sighs> like, oh, my God, what, am I get, what did I get myself into? Yeah. <laughs> she says, it's happening. Mm-hmm. No, what, what kills me is when she says, she says, tell me the truth. Tell me what, explain what you said on the, in the lawn. Mm-hmm. And he says, what do you think you heard? Yeah. yeah. It's a very Heisenberg move. <laughs> I was just about to say, it's like, can I get away with it a little bit longer? Like, uh-huh. uh. And the loaded question of our, our name, yeah. Stahl, my, my name, our children's names. Yes. And he says it was available. available. Oh. Which, like, that tells me you murdered someone, you took their wallet. Like, yeah. That yeah. is, it is a, it's so loaded without exploring it further. Yep. Not only is he not who he says he is. Yeah. Their entire life is a lot. Their whole identity. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So then we th- this is the scene I'm talking about where I think that the son actor does his best work because yeah. when he gets back to the house and <laughs> you know they he's found out about it and he says so what happens if I uh, rob a diner? Are you going to get mad that I don't cut you in? Oh, yeah. yeah. And then the best the best line for me from him, which is, if I tell Sam about you, are you going to have me whack? Uh-huh. Right? Which, that's, of course, him not understanding the full, like, grasp of all this, because saying whacked, that's just, like, the mafioso, like, the generic term. But, uh-huh. what, but the sentiment is there. Like, if I go tell Sam that you really are not who you say you are, and you've yeah. confessed to mom, will you kill me? And yeah. I think... I think Tom slash Joey in that moment's like, well, of course not, but it's like, don't put me in that situation. Yeah, yeah. of course. And that's that's really good tension between the two right there. Yeah. And and I love when the sheriff arrives. I mean, well, so he goes upstairs and he stops outside his own bedroom because like, is this even his room anymore? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then the sh- then Sam, the sheriff, arrives and Tom's first move is, would you like me to make some coffee? Yeah. Because he's just trying to prolong. He is doing everything he can to get three more minutes as Tom Stall. And it almost feels like Sam's like, nah, dude, I know what you do with coffee pots. Like, I'm good. <laughs> Shit, yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah. And they're making the small talk, right, too. He's like, oh, you got the car up and running? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah for a little bit. Like, they're, he's trying to stall as long as he can, too. Like, yes. Neither of them want to have this conversation. Stall? His last name is Stall? Oh, fuck. Oh, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I'm only here for this episode, everybody. <laughs> but it also feels like like if Tommy Lee Jones and Josh Brolin's characters in No Country had a chance to to talk. Yeah, yeah really hash it out. <laughs> this is how it would feel. Like yeah. they would want to prolong the inevitable as long as they possibly could. But Maria Bello in this scene, uh, it's funny you mentioned the, the Heisenberg stuff because this now feels even more like Breaking Bad yeah, when, sure. when Skylar finds out because she says Tom is who he says he is. Yeah. And it's like, th- th- that's both a true statement and a lie, right? Because yes. it's like Tom believes he is Tom. T- Tom Stahl is, yeah, is the man that has raised my children, that, yeah. is, that I've married. 
Uh, but also there is this whole other section of, and I, and I, God, I love so much that she's clearly bullshitting Putting to try to get act. him to leave. Yeah. But then by the time he, the sheriff leaves, her cry, her fake crying has fully become real because that was awful for her. And anger and a lot of resentment. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And everything. I mean, at this point, she doesn't know what's real anymore. Right. Like, yeah. You know? And this. Uh, let me tell me how do you guys feel about this because i feel like anytime i see a movie uh-huh. and there's arguments and fighting that then turns into sex it never feels real like it doesn't feel genuine but when maria bello tries to leave she slaps him he goes right for the throat yeah. yes for her and that was probably the scariest moment of the movie to me it is yeah it 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 the, the, cronenberg has like talked a lot about this scene because unfortunately he said a lot of people have interpreted this as an assault and he's like that is not my intent yeah. but i don't think it is no I, she she pulls him in for yeah. the kiss mm-hmm. like it is it is a it is a it, all of the tension is being let out yeah it's all of this like unspoken resentment and anger and frustration all just being released in this physical act yeah. and also it's the first t- it, it it's the first time she's slept with Joey Cusack yeah. yes you know what i mean yeah. like Which leaves her bruised and battered too yeah i mean it leaves both of them like i mean look no one should have sex on wooden stairs nope. that's terrible <laughs> nope but she it, afterwards she comes out in her robe and now she does not want him to see her un- undressed right uh, yes i took this as is very primeval it's yes. very reptilian yeah. it's like i have all these emotions i don't know how to express them i this like you said this is the mother the, the father of my children yeah. but it's also this guy i'm terrified of like, it's also almost breakup sex yeah yeah right yeah like it is it is literally like i don't know what else to do <laughs> it's for me it's the scariest movie and also the most real yeah like this feels real it does and it's uncomfortable, but it's also kind of sweet and romantic, but also like like it, it's a it's a whirlwind of fucking emotions. Yeah, and absolutely. It's the best scene he's made in any movie for me. It's the smartest. It's this it is the thing that I love about Cronenberg where he he knows that there are these primal human emotions that are impossible to put into words. Yes. And it is so impossible to put a pin on how this scene makes you feel because it really is just like this uh, release. I mean, and that's what it is yeah and, and when she when they're when they finish and she tries to leave and he tries grabbing by her to the foot to make her stay now she has all the power yeah. yes it's the best scene he's directed in anything i've seen like so far it's and so fantastic i wish this movie i don't know i kind of go back and forth because i appreciate the subtlety yeah. of what he's trying to do with how low-key and restrained he is but uh-huh. also i wish he did more Somehow more self reflection mm-hmm. on just Vigo Mortensen's character in general, and the fa- like. The son should have a scene that has a similar emotional weight to it that this scene does, and I don't feel like we ever get that. Yeah. He barely talks to the daughter at all. Like I don't know. I this movie should have been longer. It, yeah, I appreciate a ninety minute runtime, but it should have been longer. <laughs> I will say with the stairs scene, um, Cronenberg was very like in tune with his actors on that scene he yeah. was concerned that there was going to be injuries trying to do all of this yeah he went to the stunt coordinator and asked if they had any sort of like um like any padding. sort of padding yeah. or anything that they could put down for the scene and whatnot and the stunt coordinator was like in all the years of filmmaking i've never had somebody ask me if they had padding for a sex scene yeah <laughs> like it was just the weirdest thing sure. in the world that cronenberg was asking for padding for the stairs for this sex scene well again we're if we're talking about two great movies with a stair sex scene uh, the room has a very similar <laughs> sequence. Something, something tells me that uh, he wasn't as concerned about the well-being. No, no I don't no. think so. <laughs> but, well, here, here's here's what I, where uh, you know I haven't directed a lot, yeah. But uh, as someone who has tried to be more of an actor director, I yeah. probably haven't succeeded. But I would take. I don't know how I would deal with that because yes, you obviously want your actors to be comfortable. You yeah. want there to be intimacy, coach. You yes. want there to be you know someone who could pad the floors, but. There's something about the authenticity of the real stairs, mm-hmm. like putting you in that uncomfortable situation, mm, like sure. that you get that performance out of that. Like that's where like the almost like the Hitchcockian Kubrickian kind of director, right? In my mind, just comes into play, and uh, you know, but and see that is why that is why I, another reason I, I like Cronenberg is he does these movies that are very concerned with 
uh, human sexuality and the human body. I mean, the human body as an instrument yeah. and as a and as a, our shells, you know. Yeah. But he is also so concerned with the sanctity of that yeah. and protecting these people. And I don't think you get a performance this strong if you're under the gun, like you would be uh, in the hands of a Hitchcock or something like that. You know what I mean? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, like there's your nudie movies that have sex scenes for the sake of just tits and ass, right? Hanging out there, but you. you most of the time with Cronenberg and a lot of other filmmakers of that stature, like, yeah. what is this? You know, this may be a sex How scene in the film. It may the be, story? Yeah. Like, what is the underlying tone mm-hmm. that we're going for here? Like, what's the uh, interpretation of what we're seeing here? And like mm-hmm. this, this could be interpreted as just sex on, on, on some stairs, but yeah. like. There's a lot more happening here than just sex, you know? I don't know. Just as a, as a, if I'm a general audience in this movie, I don't know how you see that sex scene as just a sex scene. Like, yeah, I, I feel I like agree. it's impossible yeah, yeah. Yeah. to not take away some kind of se- subtext with that, but I don't know. And then, of course, you pair this with the 69ing scene, and it's like, this is night and day. Yeah. Like, 69 is like the most intimate thing almost you can do. These are two, these are two different couples. Yeah. One is, and then this is also like one scene is very flirtatious and cautious and, and tentative. Mm-hmm. And then the other one is the, it is just full raw primal emotion. Yeah. And to see that arc over, I mean, and again, yeah, I do agree this movie could use a little more time in the oven, but like, uh, to see that arc play out across maybe 45 minutes of screen time is kind of unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. fully. Yeah. Um, so we we get, yeah, the shot of uh, Maria Bello crying with her back exposed that she's been bruised and beaten from this, this sex scene. Uh, oh, and they had to put makeup on her. There was actual, uh, actually a lot more bruises on her because yeah. of filming that scene. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe that. I believe it. But then he gets a call from his brother who really loves the word broheem. Broheem. <laughs> God so many times uh, so he, he said he, he rides to philadelphia to meet him uh-huh. and from what we see this man drives 16 hours in dead silence and mm-hmm. just uh, i'm like man you got you, no cds nothing okay <laughs> he at least stops one time for coffee yeah oh right yeah, yeah. sure and this is where he gets to the bar and meets uh chad kroger from nickelback yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's def- definitely got some kind of some kind of face and hair like it's it's extraordinary this is ruben who politely gives them the opportunity to finish your beer uh-huh. before they go. And I'm like, hey, man, take them up on that offer. You just paid for that thing. Yeah. yeah. You took one swig. Come on. <laughs> I've never had a Ginny Cream, but, uh, you know, yeah. any beer. Just finish that beer. <laughs> it's also, it looks exactly like the bar from Sleepers. <laughs> like, oh, my God, I, it does. I have expected him to, like, walk around the corner and shoot Kevin Bacon. And <laughs> Kevin Bacon's eating, like, a full steak dinner in there in the bar for some reason. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I actually love this whole conversation on the ride mm-hmm. to... Uh, Richie's house. Mm-hmm. Richie's a very upscale kind of guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got a good laugh out of that. Yeah. And honestly, like now that we've turned around, now that we know that Tom is Joey, yeah. it seems kind of awkward that he's just like big houses around here. Like, yeah, this. big you, houses. Don't you know where your brother is residing at this point in time? Yeah. Like, that's why you left because yeah. you wanted to get out of all of this. Or it plays into my theory that he did completely repress that stuff and this is all brand new information to him well like, the implication is that joey's departure royally fucked up richie's like progression to becoming a made man yeah, yeah. and so he is like had to scratch his way into having like a small pocket of this crime syndicate yeah and now he's gonna make everything right by finally killing the guy who yeah. injured and then murdered carl fogarty like yeah. that is like this is how William Hurt ascends to being, you know, the the Godfather. His his younger brother too. Yeah, yeah. I though again the, those small bits of humor. I do love that Vigo Morris is basically trying to tell this guy, "Hey, dude, my balls are probably not in the best condition right now, but be my <laughs> guest. Go ahead, frisk him." I thought that was a really yeah, good yeah, line. Yeah. Like, <laughs> William Hurt is. This is such a wild performance. It, He's something. It, the th- the thing about William Hurt is he's always either un- he o- uh, the the late great William Hurt right yes. like yes. always either doing the most or being uh, almost like asleep too restrained. <laughs> uh-huh. I'm sorry. Can we can we talk about William Hurt's beard? It's really <laughs> driving me crazy. I, I would even call this a beard. I would not call this a beard. This is like this is like Iron Man two levels. No, of bad. he like- is he is evil James Lipton sure. without the glasses. Sure. It's like, he's like, welcome to the, he's welcome to the actor's studio, brother. <laughs> he's also doing 
almost like a Brando in the Godfather yeah. kind of accent. Like he's he's all bottom lip, like jaw extended. Like yeah. that's the kind of perform. It's not bad. It is just a choice. Yes. It is when you were portraying <laughs> Tom Stahl in that little <laughs> n- place in Indiana. Mm-hmm. W- where were you reaching from Who are you guys? <laughs> when you were pu- when you were pulling for that character? Where did that come from? Oh, Joey! Like it just feels. Joe, he leans in immediately for a head boop. Uh, he wants that head boop, and he wants to smooch him. And, and Vigo doesn't want to give it to him. Yeah. He's like, nah. He's like, oh, man. that's also what's misleading. Is it almost? It- Almost seems like Richie is almost like reaching out apologetically a little or bit. like trying to mend what has happened because of that introduction. But, you know, we've all seen gangster movies. We know how that shit goes. But and he has no idea how to communicate with this new person that Joey has become. He, yeah. yeah. Do you like being married? Do you like living on a farm? I don't own a farm. A fog thought or do you, you, thought had, a you farm. had a farm? But there were a lot of horses and shit around his house. It's it's easy to mistake that he could have. He even says that. I think he's like, he smelled pigs or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's it is true that it's like this guy doesn't know how to interact with him and he's so unintentionally funny in this movie like when he's like Do you think it's unintentional? I I, I think he is ah it's so hard to say, right? I don't know. I mean, William Hurt may may fully understand that, but I think Richie doesn't cuz he's like I guess all kids try to string other younger siblings in the crib. Like he doesn't think that's a joke. That is a a wild line. I got yeah. a good laugh out of that both times. Yeah. Like knee slapper. Like that was a good one. And then he's got another funny line here in a second too. But like, damn, dude, turning your back on your brother so uh-huh. you don't have to watch him get strangled is is that's hardcore. That's yeah. yeah. That's pretty rough. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. He turns around. I, that is why that little struggle is wild. The garrote cutting into Joey's hand. Oh, yeah. Two episodes in a month. Yeah. Of well, I I guess it, two episodes in two different months uh-huh. of of wire to arm trauma. Right. Like, oh. Oh. Have you guys seen, um, was it, oh, fuck, I can't remember the movie now, but it's Brad Pitt, I want to say it was Savages. Hmm. That's the Tony Scott movie with Aaron Taylor Johnson. I don't think Brad Pitt's in that. I could be wrong. I'll have to look. I'll have to look it up. But there is one where Brad Pitt gets this contraption put around his neck, Ooh. and he kind of puts his hand in between it to stop it from happening. But sure. um, fuck, I can't. I'm, it's going to drive me crazy now. I feel like that's a that's a that's a trope at this point. Like you know, you're about to get choked, so you put your hands. Like Austin Powers is the same thing. Oh sure, when he's in the bath. <laughs> you show that turd who's boss. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking up Brad Pitt's filmography because now I'm curious too. But this little this. Show showdown is real good yeah it's real quick and i and you know what i gotta i noticed this thing as i'm going through my notes i i I think this maybe is the is the shining achievement for vigo mortensen's performance halfway through this movie i stopped writing tom in my notes and i'm calling him joey Uh, (laughs) yeah no there's lots more throat and nose trauma here yeah we we get the oops when he breaks the dude's neck. It, he 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 puts his hands up like, Ugh, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so okay, I'm thinking of the counselor, which yes. is a Ridley Scott film. Oh, I haven't seen that. I tried to watch it. I didn't get very far. <laughs> well, it, it, since we're talking about wires cutting into people, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. But uh-huh. if you want to see a crazy scene with something like that in it, check out the counselor. It's okay. a very mixed reviewed movie. Like a lot of people don't like it, and for a Ridley Scott movie, it's 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 okay. Eh. But that scene alone is is worth watching <laughs> i'll also say too if you want to count it uh final destination 2 that we did this season oh, sure also some wire trauma good so wire trauma that's who the kid looks like that's who ashton what's his face looks like that guy oh he looks like the little kid for, they're the the kid with the long arms oh, a little bit yeah that's who i thought it was is that exact guy with the, the dummy, dummy hands, hands. <laughs> the pigeon boy what Man, there's a lot of a lot of re- like things keep popping up this season. Parents <laughs> kissing their kids on the mouth, annoying teenagers yeah. who seem like they're written as younger. <laughs> yeah, parents kissing their kids on the mouth, wire trauma. Ve- very interesting season we've got going. Yeah. Kids yeah. getting killed. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's just a co- that's a theme throughout the entire show. I guess not this season's in particular. <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> but yeah, he's got William Hurt's got another funny line here with uh, Ruben who's choking to death on the ground. He's like, "How do you fuck that up? <laughs> How do you fuck that up?" <laughs> 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 shoots him in the chest and then this one henchman coming in yeah. and sparing a moment of comfort 
for his dead friend. <laughs> oh. And he's like, what are you going to do? Give him mouth to mouth? <laughs> Leave it! Go get him! <laughs> God, that was so funny. I love Richie going outside and the door closes behind him. Yeah. And you mm, just It's hear, a horror movie. Yeah. And you just <laughs> hear Vigo killing the other guy inside. It, it's it's a Jason Voorhees move. Like it's, <laughs> and then him trying to get his keys and then... Jesus, Joey. No fanfare for William Hurt's death. Just no. blammo. No final line from Vigo. Until after the bullet hits him. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, Richie. It's good. And then uh, Vigo goes and cleans his bullet wound in a fucking pond. Yeah. And I, I was just like, don't, you're going to die. You're getting sepsis from that. Like, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> my, my note here was, wouldn't it be some shit if alligator popped out and ate him like Crocodile Dundee style? <laughs> you know, Philadelphia is famous for their alligators, uh-huh. too. That's that's a very common problem. They get. <laughs> See, my note just said baptism in the lake. Great stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's good. I like it. It's good. Yeah, that's the other theme that I kind of saw there was like you know washing himself of all of this shit now and potentially truly getting rid of the joey character because before i think he says he took joey to the desert and got rid of him yeah i took joey to the desert and i killed him and i i i love that he when he returns home where his eyes have changed again oh, right yeah. like his brow is not furrowed like it was he is back to being meek uh tom stall he's seen some shit yeah yeah no, and this ending is incredible. It's the reason I wanted to do this movie. I just that this, this ending has stuck with me for years. So since since this is your pick, why don't you recap it for us? Sure. Uh, after killing Richie, Tom returns home to his family as they're they're uh, settled around the dinner table. He comes in and just sort of sadly slumps down at the table. No one is making eye contact. No one's interacting with him. And then his daughter gets up and sets a plate and a knife and fork for him. And then his son passes him the meatloaf. Mm -hmm. And then finally, he locks eyes with his wife and they exchange a, a glance of, you know, can we come back to this? Are we, what, what's next? Yeah. And we cut to black. And it, it is as so, it's so elegant. It's perfect. Yeah. Like, besides the prison food, uh, <laughs> I have one, one note that I just, it, it just keeps this thing back from being a absolute top tier perfect ending. Okay. And it's funny because there's no words exchanged here, but it's the little girl's performance. Like, I know. She just has, n- there's nothing on her face. The plate's already there with the knife and fork on it. And I know. you can hear, it's almost like you can hear Cronenberg offset going, okay, now get up. Make well, we sure this. that you turn the knife mm-hmm. to face this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But honestly, and I, I felt the same way you did, uh, Dustin, mm-hmm. but honestly, like this little kid knows nothing about what's happening. That's true. true. She's purely the, 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 this is the routine, the unknown and innocence that has not been corrupted at this point in her life yeah and it's like oh daddy's home yeah yeah and she puts like it gives you a little bit of hope for the yeah. fact that this family may be able to continue on trust me i don't like the girl playing the daughter i i, I think her performance <laughs> in the entire movie is is really really bad yeah josh said i don't like her <laughs> <laughs> I, hey, but i'm in the same boat no, I don't, I feel, I, yeah. and i feel bad because again she's just a little she's a little actress and uh-huh. uh, you know not to diminish kid actors but sure. i've seen great kid performances this is just not one of them sure but I think her I think her moment in that scene is detrimental to the scene. Oh, it is. It is. I just wish it was delivered better. Yeah. Like I I don't know I didn't I don't even know how how do you like it's so kind of pretentious, but like how do you make someone setting a table look prestigious? Like yeah. It's, yeah. it's a very weird direction, but for, I I it's I know when I see a bad performance. It's almost like the kid needed to be a little bit older. That, it's almost like they needed a little bit older of, a, of an actor. That or she, it's, it's unfortunate, she just has a very blank expression on her face. Sure. Of like, yeah. I'm in a movie. That's what I feel coming from her, which is unfortunate. Plus, this might have been, well, no, I was going to say this might have been one of the first times Cronenberg's worked with kids, but that's absolutely not true. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Never mind. The, the brood and yeah. But no, this whole ending is, it's so well, like if I was teaching a class on how to do facial acting and getting your point across without saying words, this would be a top tier example. Mm -hmm. Like this is all emotions. There's so much being said without saying anything at all. Yeah. And something I noticed on the second watch, it's interesting to me that Maria Bello, you could see it in the scene. She kept the wedding ring on, Mm -hmm. but didn't set the table for him. Yes. Well, I mean, she... She doesn't even know if he's coming back. I like, don't know why he left. Yeah. yeah. But that's a question I have. Maybe she didn't anticipate him coming back, but I feel like that was a conscious choice. Yeah. yeah. And it, it says so much. It could be, well, I'm keeping the wedding ring on in case I go out into town and I'm keeping up appearances. Oh, sure. Or 
it could say, I really still love this person. I love Tom. Mm -hmm. I'm just, now I got to deal with Joey. Like it says a lot. The only thing is this weird about it is, is the daughter reaches behind her, like on this little, like, uh, uh, I don't know, like a China cabinet or whatever and grabs the plate and forks or plate, fork and knife and puts it on. Like it's not put away. Yeah. Like it's, it's obviously been out for him, but they just didn't set his place. It's like they were hoping he'd come home or like just on the off chance that he came home. That's why I noticed it on the second time. I'm like, she still got the ring on, but she didn't set the, the table for him and i thought it's that interesting was, i thought it said it, it's ambiguous but it says a lot of different things i think it does yeah yeah, yeah. it's a it's a brilliant ending and, and, and it's also interesting that the family seemingly allows them back in but they're it also feels like they're terrified of them. They're they're still on guard. Yeah. yeah. It's, well, I mean, like, like, where do you go from here? Like, none of them are none of them are looking him in the eyes until she does. Yeah. I mean, uh, you don't know. You, you've already gotten a piece of what you don't know about this person. What mm-hmm. else could be coming down the line? Yeah. Oh, sure. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And and I don't think they. I don't think accept they're accepting him again. Yeah. Out of like fear of retaliation or anything i don't think it's that no i just think they don't they don't know how they feel about it yes yeah because this is this is still what like 48 you know or you know, 72 hours of film time essentially yeah. like, like in the world you know it's they're still it's a weekend yeah their their lives have been changed everything they think about their lives has changed in like three or four days yeah, yeah. And, and and it does say what's next like that's the button on the end of the movie without saying it and yes. i love that that's where we end it like yeah i, I don't know i don't know what's next right <laughs> who could know and thank god they were never just like more violence you know they never did another movie to like explore what was next like yeah. it is a perfect ending to this th- this story well that's the other thing like coming coming off of cronenberg's previous work too i mean you're so used to the body horror and the grotesque images and yeah. things that he is known for right for this movie to come out as a cronenberg movie and like or anybody that's discovering Cronenberg like oh well history of violence he did that I gotta watch it you might be disappointed to see that there's he's very reserved in this movie yeah, yeah. and and Cronenberg himself was even like nope there's too much violence going on like I want to tone it down I don't want it to be glorified yeah. but it's sir it serves the story I think really well right like that's that's ultimately what I love about it is when there is violence. Yes. Some of the times when they cut to it, it's very grotesque, but it's realistic in a sense. Mm-hmm. That's what I was going to say. That's the body horror you get is like mm-hmm. when you see the guy's face after the coffee pot hit him and he's yeah. just like his face is just mangled or the nose bone stuff. Ugh. Because everyone has to live with the repercussions of the violence. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. And not just the victims of it, the people that did the crimes. Because like Absolutely. Vigo seems uncomfortable yeah. after doing it. He's, it's purely out of self-defense. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I don't know. You don't get that kind of level of, of self-awareness with, with any kind of violence in any movie, almost. Absolutely. So uh, that's... I, I, I'll go ahead and tell you now, I do recommend this movie. Yeah. Like, uh, we'll get, we can go ahead and get to the recommendations now. I've... The first time I watched it, I was very indifferent to it because I didn't know what to expect. I was expecting there to be some kind of Cronenbergian kind of flair to it, and there's not really. Right. But on the rewatch, it played so much better for me. And I still think there's some flatness to it in certain parts, Uh and I really wish there was either no score or just a better one. Yeah. (laughs) But this is the only Cronenberg movie that I've seen that I would actually say I think is like a great movie Mm -hmm. and I enjoy. Yeah. Because like- I recognize the greatness of something like Videodrome and stuff like that, but it's not something I have a good time watching, Mm. you know? So, but this is one that I'll definitely revisit because I, for 90 minutes, it's... (laughs) They do so much. Well, I say, I definitely say, if you like this movie that much, you definitely need to be watching Eastern Promises. 100%. I'm going to check it out. Yeah. I'm going to check it out this week, I think. Maybe that's my Thanksgiving movie. Yeah. I <laughs> might pick something a little more family friendly. <laughs> that's fine. My, my family doesn't watch movies that much anyway. I mean, that one that one deals with family in a sense, but not the kind of family drama you want to deal with on Thanksgiving. <laughs> right. No, I, I want to make the family uncomfortable, so I might put it on. There, there you, go. you go. Perfect one. So, recommendation? Yes. Yeah, I would absolutely recommend it. I I was a little more mixed on it this time. There, like like you said, the the things we're pointing out, the score and some of the performances are a little funky or it just inconsistent. But I overall, I think this is such a such a rich text. Mm-hmm. There are things that you can take away from every viewing that are different. And uh, again, for that ending alone, I think it's 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 one of my favorite endings of a movie. And I, I don't like I'm not even like exaggerating. Like I, it is stuck with me for seventeen years at this point. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I would one hundred percent recommend checking this one out. Yeah. Like I said, I if I were to teach a film class, this would be a part of my lesson plan. If yeah. I'm just talking. 
like the sex scene, I feel like is important. Yeah, ambiguity. <laughs> yeah, the ending, I feel like is important. There's there's so much here that I think is. Uh, it, it just it's definitely separate separated itself from other similar kinds of movies. Yeah, like it's not an action movie, even though the trailer will have you believe that. This is very much a self reflective drama that I just wish reflected a little bit more. Right, that's all. A lot of the stuff that we were complaining about too, maybe reflections of the time, like yeah. the score and whatnot. Because oh, that too, yeah, it's definitely. You know, like I I love True Romance, but god damn, I could do without the score in that movie. Sure, <laughs> I, I but see, I like that score. It's not a, it doesn't fit the movie, but I like the score. <laughs> <laughs> separate from it from yeah i mean the, the, the score itself fine but just just joined with that movie it's like these two do not match guys uh-huh. like where wh- where were your heads when you were coming across the music for this can i actually tell you something real quick yeah this is a real quick story but when i was in film school we did play this game in one of the classes where it was trying to identify a movie based on the score itself like just a snippet of it sure and, and not to brag, but I would get most, like, I got all of them except the true romance one. <laughs> <laughs> but because I knew, I recognized the music, but yeah. I'm like, I because it was the little, like, xylophone bells part. And I was like, oh, I know sure. this score. Yeah. That says something about that movie. <laughs> yeah, it's the same stinger they go to throughout the entire damn movie. Yeah. Uh-huh. Anytime anything emotional is happening, it's just steel drums. Doom, 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 yes. doom, 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 doom. <laughs> that, but that was the part that I was like, I know the score, but I, that, I guess that says something about the movie that I just could not. I, I can't picture what this is. Yeah. yeah, like I, I got the the Batman one with just the the opening horn and how low key that is. And oh I was like, yeah. yeah, I'm proud of myself. And then I could not remember True Romance. <laughs> I'd love to see how I do in a game like that. Because awesome. I've 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 only recently really gotten into like noticing the scores and nah. how the scores set the moods for movies and whatnot. In my older years, when I was younger, score was never anything that was on my mind. Yeah, yeah. but. No, like we we talked about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre a little while back. Yeah, and the fact that there is no score in that movie is like if you mm-hmm. it's, it's like sounds from a slaughterhouse yeah. and saws and yeah. But it's like if you were to put music over this, I don't think it would be as effective. Nope. Yeah. Like you need to know when the music will work and when it won't. You know, Josh, I can't wait for us to get to the Bond movies when John Barry starts using a lot of synthesizer, <laughs> or or when Bill Conti fucking takes over. <laughs> yeah. Um. So recommendations josh yes no fuck this movie don't watch it <laughs> i'm just kidding uh i mean it would be it would be a little lower on my list of cronenberg movies i just i i love when he kind of goes off into the weird and unusual sure. sort of video um you want to talk about a movie that you might not like on the first viewing you might not like on the third or fourth viewing but definitely is something that you need to watch in your life is Naked Lunch. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen that one either. It is one of the most bizarre movies Uh I've ever seen. Mm. But that's all I can say about it. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Like, the normal everyday film goer would definitely prefer a movie like this over Naked Lunch. Uh I I can absolutely see that. But I kind of love when he goes off on his old, like, weird out there sort of things. Another one that he did is Existence. Yeah. um, Which is all about a video game. Yeah, you're like a big fan of existence right yeah. like that's the one with the weird like flesh gun the right? bone gun <laughs> yeah it's it's got like bone guns and flesh video games and shit like it's it's absolutely a 90s era cronenberg movie so <laughs> sure. check that one out too if you want if you like weird shit but okay. yeah i mean i absolutely recommend this movie i mean you got vigo mortensen i the fact that william hurt was nominated yeah. and, and vigo mortensen wasn't crazy and, or maria bello or yeah. maria, maria bello, bello yes like oh. b- both of their performances are miles better than William Hurt's. I'm not really <laughs> shitting on William Hurt. I think he's good in this too, but uh-huh. his performance compared to their two is like, whoa, like 100% agree. Th- this is way different. But yeah, I mean, this is this is one of those movies that's like, if you can stomach this movie, it's a great movie. But you're gonna you're gonna be a little turned off by some of the shit that happens in it. Yeah, but absolutely. I mean, if you if you like a mystery, I think this has a great mystery to it. Yeah. If you if you were to go into this movie knowing nothing, I think it's be it would, it's one of those movies where you would go, "Holy shit!" Yeah, you know, I think it'd be definitely a good gateway to Cronenberg. Like, yes, it's separate from what he normally does, but I think this eases you in as a mainstream audience. Yeah, to open you up to potentially other stuff that he does, mm-hmm. and that's why I think like Crimes of the Future is sort of a return to form for him because he goes pretty bizarre in that one. Yeah. But it also has a very noir feel like this movie does. Mm -hmm. So I just I literally didn't have the stomach for it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's get into all of our wrap up segments here. Let's get into prop cop. 
So Nathan, yeah. um, prop cop is obviously where we look at all the different props in this movie, and we snag one each for ourselves. Yeah. What is a prop from a history of violence that you'd like to own? I want a piece of that pie. God damn it. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Literally, my first one that I wrote down a slice of that lemon meringue pie. Well, it's a whole pie. We can we, we, we can, can share it. it. Okay, but also, <laughs> uh, if I can do a second one, since Mally's not here. Okay, uh, I don't know if this counts as a prop, but I want the staircase that William Hurt comes down when, oh, he, sure. like, when Joey arrives because I just want to make some dramatic entrances. Of course, of course, he'd be it'd be a good Bond villain sort of entrance. <laughs> yeah, flanked by my boys. <laughs> <laughs> when um. When they're at the shoe store, uh-huh. uh, that also happens to have little knickknacks in the mall. Right, right next to the the one that the little girl picks up. There's a <laughs> a little porcelain cow that's yeah. like kind of <laughs> sitting. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I thought it was kind of funny. I was like, I want that. That'd be kind of cool. On. That's nice. Yeah, little little uh, little bobbles. <laughs> little little bobbles. Uh, Josh, do you have a prop cop from this movie? There's kind of not that many like distinctive props right well i mean i i would and as far as my prop goes i would want to go back to a little bit more of a simpler time mm-hmm. uh-huh. when cell phones weren't a necessity mm-hmm. but they were nice to have i want tom's sweet ass cell phone holster he has on his belt <laughs> sure <laughs> sure all right very nice make me feel like i'm 20 again man right on all right well let's get into bit part which is, of course, we recast one of the, uh, you know, unnamed featured extras in the movie as ourselves uh-huh. to build our filmography here. I'll go ahead and tell you mine. I want to be the uh, the henchman that comes in at the end uh, <laughs> that spares a moment of, of sadness for his fallen brethren yeah. that William Hurt then yells at. So. Fantastic. I kind of want to be that guy. Plus, I get squibbed up and shot by Viggo Mortensen. Yes. (laughs) This one might be the most obscure that I've ever done. Oh, boy. (laughs) Okay. When Fogarty leaves the diner Uh the first time, Uh there is this old lady who's like doing a crossword puzzle and she kind of like gives him a look and just sort of like shakes her head like whatever. Like she kind (laughs) of gives him this look like, I don't know what your deal is. And I like that. Okay. Okay. Uh, what about you, Josh? Do you have a bit part? Uh, well, I mean, just for the sheer fact that uh, his diet probably fits mine. I'm that <laughs> dude who eats at the diner every day. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, a good, that's a great role. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's. how about we get into the, the part that people are probably most likely here for, uh-huh. which is the whole crux of the show, the silver lining to a history of violence. I guess I'll go ahead and go first. Mine, I I had a couple because I wanted to just have the options, but the one that I want to go with is that Charlotte was saved from being assaulted or worse in that diner. Yes. Yes. So thanks to to Tom's quick acting during that, that robbery. So. All right. What about you, Nathan? Uh, I, I'm assuming there's no more crime in Philadelphia left. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I wrote that too. Joey may be dead for good this time because there's no more crime. <laughs> All right. What about you, Josh? Do you have a silver lining? Uh, yeah. I mean, at least Maria Bello's character is now getting some head. Hey! <laughs> oh! Wow. Wow. <laughs> Wow, wow, wow. It's not like the high school days. It, 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 at least at least Tom's got that silver tongue, so He sure does. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's great. Good for him. Mm-hmm. Good for them. Good for the good for her in particular, but good for them. <laughs> She's getting hers. She's getting hers. She is. So let's say this. This movie obviously very bleak uh, at the end. Lots of violence, lots of uh Lots of dead people at the end. What if people are watching this movie and it's just not enough? Like uh, our silver linings are like, guys, I'm still still feeling pretty dour over here. Uh-huh. Why don't we do what we normally do here, which is we pair the movie of the week with a double feature, another movie also known as the pick me up, uh, the pick me up alternative. Uh-huh. What's a movie people should watch after they watch a history of violence to to bring their spirits back up? Let's go with you, Nathan. What do you got? Uh, so I don't know if this is necessarily a pick me up, but. I would recommend 1995, I think it's 95, 96, mm-hmm. The Prophecy, starring oh. Christopher Walken uh-huh. <laughs> as the uh, Archangel Gabriel, uh-huh. but uh, most uh, germane to this film because Viggo Mortensen plays Lucifer in it, mm-hmm. and he's great, and for like two scenes. <laughs> okay. That's a good choice. It's up there up there with Peter Stormare as like one of the great Satans in film history. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, Josh, what about you? Do you have a, a suggestion? I have two movies I'd like to throw out there. One is similar in tone to this, which is not really part of the rules, but I'm doing it anyway. No, go ahead. <laughs> go for it. I feel like 
This movie would be a great double feature with Gone Girl. Ooh, yeah, okay. I can see that. Past episode, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, though. That's okay. Gone Girl has a, a, a turn of the a twist, you might say, in the middle that you kind of shift towards like, oh, holy shit, what's happening here? Sure. And, and sure. recontextualizes the first half of the movie. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, also ends on an ending that is not super happy and very bleak. Yeah. Um, but if you want to see a movie that will lift your spirits a little bit, you, you kind of have to work to it. Uh-huh. And I think this would kind of work with this one is The Fugitive. Oh, yeah. okay. Yes. Okay. Which, oddly enough, Harrison Ford was originally supposed to be cast as Tom mm. slash Joey in this. That's mm. fascinating. Okay. Which, honestly, I w- I'm not going to say Viggo Mortensen's not the guy for this role, but I want to see Harrison Ford play this role. <laughs> that would be interesting. That yeah. would certainly be interesting. I took Joey out in the desert and I killed him. <laughs> I, think, I mean, if that's the case, if that's Harrison Ford doing that, I think he genuinely took a guy named Joey to the desert and killed him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's, a, you know, Fugitive's not lighthearted by any means, yeah. but he's an innocent man and he has to prove his innocence. By the end, you do get his innocence proven. Yeah. Spoiler alert. But <laughs> by by this point, if you haven't seen The Fugitive, what the fuck are you doing with your life? It, it's a fun movie. <laughs> I didn't kill my wife. I killed five other people. <laughs> and Ed Harris is like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Ed Harris is the cop instead of Tommy Lee Jones. <laughs> Yeah, yes. yeah, I'd watch that. I've got two, um, and I guess I'll, I'll throw one out since Miley's not here. Uh, the first one I went with, which is, if you want to watch Viggo Mortensen also being a good dad in another movie, you uh-huh. should check out Captain Fantastic. Oh, that's oh, a great movie. Yeah, good call. Yeah. But, and I've mentioned earlier, another movie that this gave me kind of similar vibes to, which is a, a real case of mistaken identity, you should definitely check out North by Northwest. Yes. Yeah. If you're speaking of Bond, that's your prototypical Bond movie right there. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, they they uh, used that last set piece for mm-hmm. From Russia with Love. I uh-huh. mean, that was like the f- fully the inspiration. Yeah. 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 And, and Lazenby looks a lot like Cary Grant. That's true. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think both of those are great choices. And the choices you guys pulled out were great as well so thanks. thanks buddy well listener if you have some feedback you want to give us either about the show or about the movie a history of violence tell us your thoughts on it you can do so by either emailing us at the silver Linux playlist at gmail.com or you could dm us on instagram or facebook or uh-huh. sorry never mind fuck facebook yeah, we're on twitter yeah. only and instagram only so just those two places and maybe not twitter for long who knows yeah well i mean at this point twitter may be gone we, who knows this episode's in the it, you know we're recording this uh right before thanksgiving so we may be gone Yep. <laughs> if you find this recording, we didn't survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you can also check us out on TikTok and uh, Twitter and Instagram as well, because we post uh, every day some snippets from the show, some behind the scenes stuff occasionally. Thanks for watching us on TikTok, guys. Like, yeah. holy shit. Like, we're, like, really good response. I love you guys' little snippets on there. Oh, oh, I love you. the snippets you guys put up with the show. All Dustin. Yeah, yeah. TikTok really loved... Uh, Love the walk hard stuff. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> who who would have guessed? But yeah, uh, feel free to uh, subscribe if you haven't already, so you can get notified the second an episode drops. Yeah, uh, and you know, if you wouldn't mind, you could leave us a rating and some feedback. We'd really, really appreciate that on your whatever podcasting app or platform you're listening to us on. We'd really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I think lastly, I would say, please, if you haven't already, just tell your friends and family about the show. We'd really appreciate that. So next week is my clue. Uh, we're getting close to Christmas time. Uh, it's not really relevant, but just, uh-huh. just throwing that out there. Uh, I've got a clue for us. And that clue is, if you're missing our show, look for our coming on the first light of next Monday. <laughs> At dawn, look to your favorite podcasting app. I, you know what's so funny? Mm-hmm. I didn't realize I had done, we've done a little back-to-back with uh, one of our stars here. Mm-hmm. We sure have. That's so great. It's almost serendipitous. Yeah, he's he's returning to us at the turn of the tide. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like the, like you mentioned earlier, the king returned. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Not really relevant to what we're talking about next week, but who almost knows? Yeah. Oh, a little bit. Almost. Uh, now, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to go make me myself uh, some potatoes. You know, <laughs> po potatoes. Potatoes. Mm-hmm. Well, Josh, thank you very much for coming back, and uh, I guess next time we talk another Cronenberg movie. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be here. Anytime you want to hear Cronenberg talk, I'll be there. It's almost guaranteed. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, any final thoughts, uh, last words before we get out of here for the week? I don't. Maybe ask yourself, <laughs> why is he so good at killing people? I was hoping to be like, ask yourself, why he, why he's so good at hosting podcasts? Why he's so good <laughs> at hosting podcasts? Ah, 
Well, uh, I, we're definitely longer than the runtime of the movie now, so let's yep. get out of here. I will say, uh, rest in peace, Oatmeal, and uh, Nathan. Carl since, Fogarty. Yeah, oh. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> since this is your first episode back since then, uh, we did decide to name the new rabbit Tiffany. Oh, yay. Yeah. Prin- Princess Tiffany. I, I let her outside in the, fr- the backyard for the first time last night, and she loved it. Oh, enchanting. Doing all kinds of flips and binkies out there. She was having a good time. So. Amazing. It, it changed my life when I found out that, that rabbits do a thing called a binky mm-hmm. and that's what it means when they're happy yep. and that is like i like legitimately i was like i'm different now that i know that <laughs> yeah oh we didn't know what that's what it was the first time we're like is he okay yeah. like when we first got oatmeal and then why is he spasming <laughs> yeah i'm like is he having a seizure what <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh no it's it's a good feeling when your rabbit does that so it's the best audience if you've never seen it go just go to youtube and type in rabbit binkies i'm binking i'm binking <laughs> hold on i'm binking <laughs> all right well uh uh, with, with that, with, without further ado, I will say, as always, don't forget your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Excelsior! 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 Oh, look at us! up another fantastic episode of the Silver Linings Playlist. If you would be so kind, we ask that you leave us some feedback on how we did, plus a like and subscribe. We'll be back next week with another great episode. See ya!